Excuse me, can I have your attention? Please do not block the exit doors. I repeat, please do not block the exit doors, please. <laughs>
Chicago. Welcome, we're just testing the virtual town hall connection. Testing one, two, three, we're just testing the virtual connection. Testing one, two, three. Microphone check, microphone check, podium microphone check, one, two, three, one, two, three, three. check, one, two, three, check, one, two, three. <laughs>
Excuse me, everyone. How do I answer? There we go. No, I know. Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started in a couple of minutes, and I appreciate that this room is incredibly well packed. Um, we're going to have a wonderful evening, I can assure you of that. Uh, I'm going to give this just a couple more minutes. We're expected to start at 6.30. We'll start at 6.30. There's many people uh, beyond the chamber here that are either seated, uh, seated or standing room only. So a couple more minutes. Our panelists are going to get in place, and, and we'll get on. Uh, with uh, some important information for you and I'm looking forward to the questions and the comments that we're going to hear tonight uh, because this is a gay, engaged community and we know that uh, this is an incredibly important topic so it goes without saying. attention here. Excuse me, we're going to get started. It's 6.30. Can everyone hear me? Just, are we all right? Can you hear me? Speak, okay. We're... Okay. of two information forms for our OLG casino process. Um, we are in council chambers. This is obviously the place where we have our, all of our standing committee meetings and council meetings. Uh, this is an information forum tonight, so uh, it's a little different. Uh, it's going to be moderated uh, by myself. Uh, my name is Chris Murray. When I'm not moderating, I'm also the city manager. So tonight, uh, was that a shout out that I had there? So, so tonight, uh, we're going to start at 6.30. We're supposed to end at 8.30. Uh, I got a feeling, if it's anything like last night, uh, we'll probably be a little later than 8.30, which is okay. Uh, because I think if I judge the, the proceedings last night, uh, they went very well. Uh, we had, I think the highlights were really the questions and the comments that we had uh, from those in attendance. So uh, looking forward to that tonight. And so we're not necessarily having to cut off at, uh, at 8.30. Uh, just a few uh, precautions here. In the event that something happens that we have to uh, clear this building, uh, we should try to stay away from the fire exit as much as possible. So uh, if we need to exit this building in a, in a quick fashion, if we could just watch for those exits, that would be appreciated. And of course, they're up at the top uh, of this chamber. Um, as well... Um, what I found last night, which was incredibly good, was the the hundred plus people that were in attendance uh, made a point to make sure that this was respectful uh, and made sure that their comments were pretty much on the mark and that uh, you know everything would uh, unfold in a, in a in a good way and and that's really what Hamilton is all about. So we have people that have obviously different views here tonight, and that's critical. The the thing you need to understand as well is that council has not made a decision 
decision on the OLG casino matter. Uh, you have members of council here tonight, which we're going to introduce here in a moment. Um, they're here to listen to you. Uh, they're here to listen to the panelists. Uh, they want to understand uh, uh, clearly your views. Uh, they can certainly see them, but we're going to hear them tonight. So I think that's, that's a very good thing. Um, Aside from having a number of people here, and we estimate we probably must have somewhere in the order of 300 to 400 people quite easily. Um, it's more than just your traditional meeting where people show up. Uh, this is also being uh, televised right now on Cable 14. Uh, and as well, uh, we've done something a little different uh, in that we have made calls out to, I, I understand, approximately 50,000 people. There are, in, uh, the estimate is about 20,000 people right now are listening on phones to uh, what is going to be uh, heard tonight and so uh, uh, we are going to be uh, obviously uh, asking or allowing people here to uh, ask questions and so we'll get to the, the specifics of the format in a second. Um, but before we do that uh, I have a number of members of council here tonight and so if I could just recognize them uh, just for a minute. Uh, we have uh, to my left uh, Councillor Maria Pearson and to my left beside her is uh, Councillor Scott Duvall. We have Councillor Partridge, Councillor Whitehead, Councillor Marula, Councillor Clark, Councillor Ferguson somewhere. Councillor Ferguson, fantastic. If I've missed anyone, I'll be fired, but uh, <laughs> I don't see it. So that's, so I'm good so far. Um, Oh, Councillor Morelli as well. Sorry, I missed you, Councillor Morelli. Um, I just want to introduce to you tonight as well our panelists. Um, uh, in, in many cases, these are individuals who are subject matter experts on a full range of matters related to casinos, uh, what their advantages and disadvantages are. Um, we should be quite appreciative of them being here, quite honestly. I think uh, it's good that they, they bring their talents to this, uh, uh, to this forum. And so we have with us tonight uh, OLG Vice President of Transformation, Rick Gray. Rick, just wave your hand. Uh, as well, we have uh, Bruce Barber from Flamborough Downs. He's the Executive Director of Horse Racing Operations. Bruce, thank you, Bruce. We also have uh, Deputy Police Chief Ken Leanders. Ken? Programs from the Center for Addictions and Mental Health, Robert Murray. No relation. Uh, next to Robert is the medical officer of health, our own Elizabeth Richardson. And I am looking for, and I'm not seeing her, uh, she should be here, is uh, Professor Hannah Holmes, uh, Department of Economics. And uh, on her way. she is she on her way. Until six o'clock tonight. She had to teach till six o'clock tonight. So Hannah will be here. I just want to uh, mention that last night we had Dr. Kabersi, uh, who filled in for Hannah because she wasn't able to make it last night. Um, he was fantastic. Uh, he was a very spirited individual that knows an awful lot about casinos and their their impacts. Um, we had hoped that we could get him to come here again tonight and have both Hannah and Dr. Bercy speaking, but unfortunately he had another engagement, so uh, uh, despite our efforts, he's unable to attend tonight. So in terms of the format of this evening, um, first we're going to hear a number of presentations from our panelists. Uh, we're going to try and ask them to keep to roughly seven or eight minutes each, um, and I think the reason for that is that uh, we found there was a lot of value that came out of the questions that followed and the comments that uh, our citizens were making, and so that kind of question and answer format uh, seemed to work quite well last night. So I will be saying to each of the panelists when we're getting close to that seven or eight minute mark, I'll give you a one minute warning, and, uh, and if you could just wrap wrap up your comments, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, as well as they start to talk, because not everyone will want to stand up to a microphone and ask questions, we're going to ask those that want to write down a question to raise their hand, and we have some staff, they're going to try and get pieces of paper and pencils to you so that we can get your questions written down, gather them, and ask them uh, of our panelists as well. Uh, in terms of those that, are, that want to stand up to a mic, we have a microphone that's right directly in front of me here. 
We're going to ask people when it's time to, uh, to ask questions to, we're going to clear a pathway so that people can line up in a particular direction and we can take questions from you. And back to our virtual town hall, uh, we're also going to have people who are listening in tonight uh, on telephones and, 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 uh, and uh, through possibly their computers as well. Uh, to uh, They're going to be engaged as well. We're going to give them a chance to uh, ask questions via the telephone. So uh, that's another way in which we're going to get people's ideas and comments. Um, so with that, um, I don't think I have much more I need to say. Did uh, Hannah show up? Okay. Uh, no, she did show up. I'm telling you, she's right here. Uh, Professor Hannah Holmes, Department of Economics. If Hannah, could you just raise your hand? There we go. Okay, so that's that's enough of me. Uh, we are going to start tonight with our panelists, and so um, I'd like to start then with the OLG Vice President of Transformation, Rick Gray, and if everyone uh, just could listen carefully, I'd greatly appreciate that, and uh, we'll learn, I'm sure, an awful lot from our panel. So go ahead, to Rick. Great, thank you. Um, just before we start tonight, I would like to, uh, to compliment the entire community on, on coming out in full force tonight. Um, it's fantastic. This is, uh, this is a, an important session and it's an important decision for, uh, for Hamilton. So I applaud everybody that's here. I recognize that there are uh, different points of view and that's, that's the whole point of this meeting. So uh, thank you for that and thank you for the City of Hamilton for inviting us uh, to this public session this evening and the opportunity uh, to address the audience. As many of you know, OLG is currently undertaking a major initiative to modernize uh, the operation of lottery and gaming in Ontario. You've been able to play lottery products since 1975 with the introduction of Ontario. 8 million Ontario adults played the lottery last year. And casinos have been around since 1994 when they first opened the doors in Windsor. And 2.7 million people, uh, adults, have uh, visited our gaming sites in the last year alone. So we know that uh, it's a very, very product, um, uh, a popular product offering for uh, adult Ontarians. Our modernization initiative is focused on improving customer experience, expanding jobs uh, in our industry and increasing public money for the people of Ontario. To do this, we're going to do three things. First, we'll become more customer focused. And this means that OLG will be where the customers want us to be and will provide the games that our customers want to play. Second, we're expanding the regulated private sector delivery of lottery and gaming. This means we have identified areas of our business where it makes more sense for service providers, the private sector operators, to be involved instead of the government. Finally, we're renewing OLG's role in the oversight of lottery and gaming. This means we're looking at ways for ways to be even more efficient and focus on important priorities like responsible gambling. So what does this mean for you and your community? Well, Hamilton is currently one of 24 communities that host a gaming facility in this province now. Um, and currently uh, within the, uh, the Hamilton area we have the slots at Flamborough Downs which I might add is a very very successful um, property and I do want to acknowledge the great working relationship that we have with the owners of the track Great Canadian Gaming and uh, Bruce Barber and his team. The new OLG will have qualified service providers running the day-to-day -day operations of our gaming facilities with OLG overseeing the management of gaming operations. In order to get the private sector interested in putting up the uh, capital to run, maintain and possibly even expand our gaming operations, we do have to give them options. And that's why we've created zones around our existing 24 facilities and we've added five new zones in the province. These are areas where there is potential to either host or relocate a gaming facility. This zone is known as SW9 and it encompasses the city of Hamilton including the existing slots um, facility at Flamborough as I mentioned earlier. Whichever company gets the rights to operate gaming in this area, they will take over the existing facility and examine its commercial viability. They can also decide that it may be financially uh, beneficial to relocate it and possibly add amenities such as a convention center or a hotel to make it more than uh, simply a gaming offering. This, de this decision will not be done in isolation. The city, as always, has control of zoning. 
and OLG has to authorize and commercially uh, viable proposal for any new gaming facility through the minister. So I do want to um, you know, comment that there really are three parties uh, to arrive at this decision. You've got the municipality, you've got the private operator, and you have OLG on behalf of the, uh, the province. It's been clear from the outset that facilities will be put in communities that want them. If there are specific considerations that are important to the community, they should specify them and those will be considered and weighed when looking at the commercial viability of a gaming uh, facility in any community. And again, that's why we're here this evening. Since the slots of Flamborough opened in October 2000, the City of Hamilton has received almost $52 million from its share of the slot revenues based on 800 slot machines. With over 220 employees, OLG has paid over $134 million in wages and benefits. We've purchased more than $34 million from local and regional vendors and have sponsored local events to the tune of over $500,000. If a new gaming site is built within Hamilton's core, the private sector operator has the discretion of building a facility with up to 1,200 slot machines or less, depending on the business case. The number of tables has not yet been determined and again we would work with the, uh, the private sector to, uh, to help assess that. A relocated facility in the core of Hamilton has the potential to increase gaming revenues which would lead to increased municipal commissions and economic activity. A relocated facility would be larger than the one currently in Flamborough and could grow current revenues by 5% or more. Depending on private sector operator investments, the number of table games and, addi and, and additional uh, amenities, uh, etc. So um, it could be 5% and it could be higher than that as well. Uh, those are just estimates at this time. The potential range of revenue for the municipality um, would be in the range of five to seven million dollars per year. Uh, and again, those are preliminary uh, figures and that's up from uh, what you received today, which is north of, uh, of four million dollars. I believe it's in the neighborhood of 4.4 .4 million. Uh, tax assessment on new amenities would be roughly anywhere between one and three million dollars per year. Uh, and the investment opportunity would be in the hundreds of millions and we've estimated that the facility could be in the range of perhaps 100 to 200 million dollars. From a, um, an increase in jobs perspective, we'd be looking at uh, potentially 400 to 600 new jobs uh, in the city and depending on the amenities that the private sector offered, that number could be higher. As I mentioned earlier, we're renewing OLG's role in the oversight of lottery and gaming. This means an increased oversight in responsible gambling. Problem gambling affects a small percentage of the adult population and we recognize that. In Ontario, 3.4% have a moderate to severe gambling problem. OLG has a statutory, regular, regulatory and policy mandate to address problem gambling. Ontario has a vast and strong structure that supports problem gambling and responsible gambling is one of the best funded uh, in North America and we've received um, accreditation from the, uh, the World Lottery Association for that program. This includes $40 million to the Ministry of Health for Research, Prevention and Treatment and almost $14 million of OLG's internal budget is for educational programs. This plan represents significant change and a big part of that change is our vision for a sustainable player base and creating customers who make informed choices. Over the long term, the industry model that we have for gambling in Ontario will only succeed from a business perspective and from an RG perspective, a responsible gambling perspective, if we broaden our player base. We cannot Rick, rely just on a you got about another minute, okay? okay? We cannot rely on a small portion of our players for our revenue. We seek regular and casual players who spend a portion of their disposable entertainment income gambling in a healthy way over the long term. For those who may develop a problem, we ensure that there are many supports uh, that are in place, like free counseling in every community where a casino exists. OLG is grateful for strong working relationships that we have developed and the collaborations that have helped us design and deliver elements of our responsible gambling program, like CAMH and the Responsible Gambling Council. OLG has, direct, has been directed to del deliver a gold standard for responsible gambling and this is what we will, will and continue to do. In conclusion, OLG has introduced a public information tool, modernolg.ca, to support our modernization process where you will find great information about our process, OLG's commitment to responsible gambling, as well as more specific information on how it affects each business area. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Rick. Just, uh, I'm going to suggest to the panelists, if you could lean in and speak into your microphone, because we want to make sure that people that are in the atrium can hear. So uh, if we can speak up, that would be, uh, be appreciated. So we'll now turn to Bruce Barber, uh, Flamborough Downs. Bruce? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, too, would like to thank the uh, people of Hamilton for allowing us this opportunity to speak to you. Um, and we do realize that this is a very delicate uh, decision and tough decision that the City of Hamilton has to make. Um, I'd like to start, uh, I want to talk a little bit tonight about uh, one who we are, uh, Great Canadian Gaming, the parent company of Flamborough Downs. And Flam and Flamborough. Could you speak right, uh, Bruce? We're having, they're having a hard time out there hearing you. So if you could speak right into the mic, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, sorry, is that better? Okay. Sense of humor. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're going to speak up. Uh, and if we can ask a question that says yes, we might get the yes crowd going. So, uh, but in any event, oh, okay. That's actually, that's probably an even, but Bruce is going to come down to the podium, the one that uh, Rosie's talking at, and uh, he'll project well there, I'm sure. Yes. So we'll... we'll... Yes. There we go. Again, thank, thank you everyone for having us here this evening. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about uh, Flamborough Downs, um, who we are, Great Canadian, who Flamborough Downs is, and um, the effect, uh, the potential of the, the, the slots at racetrack program and that, uh, the ending of that program and what the potential that will have on the racetrack at Flamborough Downs and the jobs and the horse people involved. Uh, Great Canadian Gaming uh, is the parent company of Flamborough Downs. Uh, we are the largest publicly traded company in Canada, gaming company. We are a Canadian company. Um, we, I know a lot of people here in Ontario that we work with think of us as a racetrack company here in Ontario, but in fact we're more than that. We own uh, 17 properties across Canada and North America. Uh, those uh, we have properties ranging from Nova Scotia to Ontario, British Columbia, and Washington State. Part of part of the uh, makeup of Great Canadians properties includes four racetracks, uh, two in British Columbia and two in Ontario. And we are the largest racetrack operator in the province in Canada. So uh, we know racing and we know gaming. Uh, as a company, we have 4,700 employees across the country. Uh, we are uh, we have a very strong balance sheet, and we're in a position to grow uh, both here in Ontario and in other jurisdictions as well. Um, one of the things as well with Great Game, we we have gaming revenue in the one billion dollar. Um, neighborhood. Of that, most of that revenue, as some know and some don't know, actually goes to the province. So there's a billion dollars in revenue and on top of that we have over a billion dollars in capital invested in our business. On, on the racing side, uh, we, the four tracks that we own, the two in British Columbia are Fraser Downs and Hastings Park. Here in Ontario we own Flamborough Downs and Georgian Downs. Uh, in the province of Ontario as a corporation, we now have over $200 million invested in the province. So we are uh, very invested, as they say, in Ontario. Uh, Flamborough, for those, and I'm sure a lot of you have been out there, and for those that haven't, uh, Flamborough Downs is the uh, racetrack and uh, uh, casino run by the OLG here in Hamilton. And I think we need to make sure everyone's aware we are here in Hamilton. Uh, it may be Flamborough, but it's Hamilton. Um, we feature, of course, a half-mile standard red racetrack. And for those that don't know, it's, we view it as the fastest standard red track in the world for half-mile. Um, 
We have uh, at the facilities, the OLG has 800 slot machines. We have four dining options. We have meeting rooms. We have off-track wagering at the track. We have off-track wagering in other si two other sites in Stony Creek and Burlington. Um, we race 188 days of racing right now at Flamborough Downs, which is over 12% of the racing in Ontario. Our handle, which is the bet on at the track at Flamborough Downs is uh, close to $70 million. Our Ontario bet is $100 million. So we are, uh, we understand racing and we're very immersed in racing. So what does all this mean to Hamilton? Um, on the, I guess on the, on the revenue side, on the money side to begin with, uh, Flamborough Downs uh, or through the slots, I should uh, delivers about 4.6 million dollars to the city of Hamilton. Taxes are in the 800 thousand dollar neighborhood, um, which is a, a direct um, to the city of Hamilton of about 5.4 million dollars. Um, Flamborough Downs uh, purchases over $5 million in goods and services from local suppliers um, here, here in Hamilton. Um, salaries, which is important both to the council and to Hamilton. The combination of salaries between the OLG and Flamborough is close to $16 million a year in salaries that, that come back into the community. And on our side of the business, we because of our knowing who our employees are, etc., 72% of the employees at Flamborough Downs actually live in Hamilton. So the bulk of that money gets does get spent into the, into the municipality. Um, one of the other um, important financial issues relative to Flamborough and racing is the horse racing side of it itself. So there's 16 million dollars in purses that are spent to the, that are that are earned by the horse people right, people racing at Flamborough Downs and we know that 66 percent of those horses are from our catchment area. They're, they they live in the farms if you will in and around Flamborough Downs and that accounts for 10 million dollars more going into uh, the, the Hamilton community. So in fact, direct financial into Hamilton is $36 million. That's, that's direct money. That's not any money moving from, uh, you know, the economic spin-off of horse racing moving out through the community. On, on the people side, so that's the money side, and on the people side, which is really key, is how many people are employed at Flamborough, how many jobs are there. Between the OLG and Flamborough Downs, there's over 400 jobs, direct jobs. There's also another 250 jobs a day when the horse people are there racing their horses, trainers, drivers, grooms looking after those horses. As well, um, You'll hear, uh, you'll hear some of it tonight, and you'll, you, I'm sure you're hearing it in the newspaper, that the slots at Racetrack Program, this, they'll, they, you'll hear it as SARP, has been cancelled effective March 31st. Bruce, with, if I can, just sorry to interrupt, you got about another minute. Okay, okay. With, with that, um, the purses for the horse people will be gone, and 85% of the purses for, for the people racing at Flamborough have come from the slot side of the business. So, but more important on, on the people side, there's 450 people working at Flamborough Downs. The OMAFRA panel has identified 30,000 jobs and the economic spin-off for horse racing in the province of Ontario. Given that there's over 12% of those races happen at Flamborough, we would say there's 34 to 3,600 jobs indirect jobs if you will. So a total of over 4,200 jobs at Flamborough. Um, and I just wanted to make sure before I leave that everyone realize that, that we at Flamborough Downs are completely committed to horse racing and do and are working hard with the OMAFRA panel, ORIA, our local horsemen, Racetracks of Ontario to ensure that racing continues. But one of the messages tonight is without help from the government with the cancellation of slots at racetracks, March 31st, horse racing at Flamborough Downs will cease to exist. So I wanted to get that message across to everyone and look forward to your questions um, during question period. 
Thank you very much, Bruce. I just want to mention that uh, Councillor Pasuto is here some out, somewhere in the atrium as well, uh, sitting down. Is he? Up? Okay. There he is right there, uh, Councillor. As well, sitting uh, at the table here is uh, Councillor Collins and Councillor Farr. So with that now, uh, Ken, if you want to come to the podium, that would be great. Uh, we have Deputy Police Chief Ken Leanhurst. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Hopefully everybody can hear me. I am the Deputy Chief of Police. I've been a police officer in Hamilton for the last 33 years and been a Deputy Chief for the last uh, nine years. It is not the position of the Hamilton Police Service to either support or reject the proposal of a casino in the city. It is our job to police this community and whatever city council decides, it will be our responsibility to ensure the safety and security of the citizens and our community. From a policing point of view, we understand that there are concerns about a casino. It will increase crime in our neighborhoods, it will bring organized crime, it will increase gang activity in the streets. From all the re review of our statistical information and academic research, it appears that this is not the case. It appears that the fear of crime is much greater than crime itself. In a recent 2012 study, casinos, it said that casinos have a similar impact that a large recreational or tourism draw would have, similar to that of the CNE or community festivals. Additional police service members may be required to handle the increased calls for service, but the probability of being a victim of crime will remain the same. From our work, in Flamborough Downs, the Hamilton Police Service has seen approximately 758 calls for service to this location in the last six years. And although Hamilton does not police inside the casinos, that is done by the OPP, we have seen the top five types of calls in this area as stolen autos, trespassing, thefts, intoxicated persons, and impaired drivers. We have also reviewed policing activities in our neighboring communities, which includes Falls View and Niagara Casinos, Woodby Casinos, and we have found that there is no significant impact with the increase of crime in this area. The Niagara experience shows that typical calls for service are thefts, motor vehicle collisions, domestics, mischiefs, and intoxicated persons. If a casino is in the core, we would expect similar types of crimes and activities. No difference than if a stadium was in the core, or if we we're lucky enough to get an NHL team. The more people that come into the core, the more opportunity there will be for incidents of crime and incidents which would require, require police response. I've previously been questioned about the number of police officers that we would require if a casino was in the core. Well, I'm telling you it's too, permanent, uh, too premature to answer that. It depends on the size, the location, and the facilities attached to it. If we look at Niagara, they have 30 officers that police their entertainment district. But in Brantford and Woodbine, there are no additional officers. What I will say that when a decision is made by council, our police service will work with the city and work with our board to determine the appropriate number of officers that are required to police this community safely. The insides of Ontario casinos are policed by the OPP in conjunction with the OLG. They are responsible for all calls of service inside, as well as gathering intelligence and preventing cheats at play. Casinos are highly regulated and numerous safeguards are in the casinos to protect against organized crime, such as background checks of the employees and owners. As, an increase in criminal act, as for increase of criminal activity outside in relation to casinos, there is no data to sh support that there is any additional criminal activity that can be tied to the activities of a casino. From a policing point of view, the Hampton Police Service is committed to policing in the city to ensure the safety of all people and their property. It is not our position in law to comment on either to support or reject the position of a casino within the city of Hamilton. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Chief Leanhurst. If uh, 
We have joining us uh, just a second ago is our, uh, our uh, Councillor McHattie uh, from One Ward One. So if I can, uh, Paul Burns from the Canadian Gaming Association, you have uh, about eight minutes. Thank you. Thanks very much. The Canadian Gaming Association represents the major participants in Canada's gaming industry, facility operators, equipment manufacturers, service providers. We are the National Trade Association for the gaming industry in Canada. There's often a lot of misinformation, myths surrounding debate on casinos, and we're applaud and thank you for the city for including us and for the gaming subcommittee for initiating this process. We've had almost two decades of history with casino gaming in Ontario, communities large and small to look to. It's been substantive and positive experience, creating thousands of well-paying jobs, generating hundreds of millions of dollars in economic development, and billions of dollars in revenue for municipal and provincial governments. Tonight's question isn't, should casino gaming be allowed in the greater Hamilton area? That's already been asked and answered in the affirmative with facilities right here in the Hamilton area for the past decade and facilities nearby in Brantford and Niagara. The types of gaming in any new facility will be exactly like those found in the current facilities. What's really under consideration is now is how best to work with the OLG and the Ontario government to realize an entertainment development that would be profitable for the community and sustainable over the long term. What it's about is where best gaming fa entertainment facilities should be located, what components, whether convention, hotel, horse racing, retail, food and beverage, entertainment and recreation will best serve as drivers of positive activities. Activities that create linkages with the existing economic environment and the community at large will create good and sustain good paying jobs. Economic success stories in Ontario communities like Windsor, London, Niagara, especially in Brantford which leveraged casino gaming at over a hundred million dollars in investment in its downtown are certainly instructive in this regard. If I go back to my earlier statement about we've had almost two decades of experience with gaming in Ontario and over a decade here in Hamilton. It has been a positive experience. People often say what I refer to as myths about gaming that are attributed to casinos and I ask you to look to your own experience in this community as you make your decisions. I want to take a few moments to speak to some of those misconceptions. You've heard about the increase in crime and I We'll let the Plamilton Police Services have the final word on the issue, but the Deputy Chief's comments are very reflective of what's occurred in, in Ontario. Some often say casinos are attacks on the poor. Gaming is an entertainment choice, a choice that is enjoyed but responsibly by the overwhelming majority of people who choose to play. They go by choice, and yes, profits from gaming, like those from the LCBO, Marketing in this. go to province. Marketing to the poor. Go to the province to pay for health care and education, a positive benefit from provincial enterprises. Who is a typical customer of casinos? Well, someone who's wealthy or older and highly educated. In fact, the analysis of OLG player database done by KPMG demonstrates just that. We talk about problem gambling. You will hear people talk about the 36% of Ontario gaming revenue coming from problem gamblers based on a study that stated the problem gaming rate at four times higher than it actually was at the time and based on the assumptions of self-reported gambling diaries of 32 severe problem gamblers over a four week period. Even the author's own words, I quote, the proportion of revenue from severe problem gamblers is very tentative because a small number of severe problem gamblers completing the prospective diaries, 32. Many other studies have put this number at 5% or less. What we do know is problem gaming rates in Ontario have decreased and stabilized since the mid-90s with about 1% of the population having a severe problem with gaming control issues and another 2 to 3% exhibiting issues around control. Yes, there have been increases in problem gambling occurs after the initial introduction of gaming and then with progressively less impact on problem gambling with extended exposure. And that has been Ontario's experience and demonstrated in numerous studies, including the one year and six month and one year follow up studies from Casino Windsor. Gaming has been accessible in this community for over a decade. Slots at Flamborough are widely accessible to residents, reachable by shuttles from downtown Hamilton, or buses even to outlying casinos in Niagara. Or more recently, what people are choosing to do is stay at home, play online through inter offshore internet sites. So it's difficult to say this is a new activity for this community. 
The industry supports and will fully implement the RG Check program of the Responsible Gaming Council as its part of this initiative, in addition to the extensive Responsible Gaming initiatives already implemented across Ontario. One last issue I want to address is talking about cannibalization of existing businesses. Recent examinations by Director De by Dr. Bo Bernhardt, Executive Director of the International Gaming Institute at the University of Nevada, of all relevant peer-reviewed research shows the prop development of gaming facilities have neither no effect or positive effects on nearby hospitality and tourism facilities, foster growth in surrounding industries, and create meaningful increases in economic growth and employment. In fact, casino jobs are well-paying, averaging about $50,000 a year here in Ontario. I hope I was able to provide some context with you on these issues, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Paul. Now, if uh, I can have, there we go, uh, Robert Murray, Manager of Gambling Programs from the Center for Addictions and Mental Health. Robert, about eight minutes, please. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this important community event. We believe that any expansion of gambling in Ontario should be preceded and informed by this kind of community consultation. First, a little bit about the, the organization I represent. The Problem Gambling Institute of Ontario, I'll refer to it as the PGIO, is a program of the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, otherwise known as CAMH. CAMH is the largest addiction and mental health hospital in Canada, a teaching hospital fully affiliated with the University of Toronto. The PGIO is, has the largest specialized problem gambling treatment program in Ontario. We provide training and support to Ontario's specialized problem gambling treatment system on a broad range of allied professionals. We have an interactive website, problemgambling.ca, that in part provides online support for people affected by problem gambling, including family members. We are also committed to the development of evidence-informed solutions to gambling-related problems through research. As part of our role to reduce the harms associated with problem gambling, we have, providing, uh, we have been providing responsible gambling consultation services and training to the OLG and other industry groups since 2005. We recognize that gambling is a social reality, but all of us need to think about how much is enough. What is the right balance between the interest of government raising revenue and the gambling industry's desire for profit versus the public health of our citizens? I should state at the outset that the primary concern of CAMH and the PGIO is for the public health of our citizens. We believe that government policies should put a priority on public health concerns over the goal of generating revenue. <laughs> gambling, is, gambling is already a big business in Ontario. It's readily available. In southern Ontario, 93% of residents are within one hour drive of a casino or a slot machine facility. For Hamilton residents, the amount of time drops to 40 minutes for a casino and 25 minutes for a slot machine facility. Ontario has the most electronic gaming machines, gaming tables, and lottery ticket terminals and games in Canada. In fact, total government revenue in Ontario outpaces all other provinces by a wide rock margin. It should be understood that the plan for gambling expansion uh, posited by the OLG includes developing more casinos, but it also has other elements to it. In combination, it has the goal of increasing net revenues by 1.3 billion, that's net, not gross, decreasing average player age from 55 to 53, increasing player petition rates from 70 to 75 percent, all of this by 2017. You should also, you should recognize it's just not about casinos, it's about lottery sales, it's about the iGaming site that's coming, there's a lot of elements to this. So by any measure, we are in for a massive expansion of gambling in this province that goes well beyond just the casinos. The next speaker, Dr. Richardson, will talk about the prevalence and the negative health impacts of uh, problem gambling, so I, I, won't, I won't speak to that for the sake of time. But there is considerable evidence that gambling has a negative impact on the health of individuals and communities. I, I will say that up to 331,000 adults in, Ad in Ontario have a moderate to severe gambling problem, more than the populations of Burlington and Cambridge combined. And here's an important thing to consider, and I realize there's some controversy over it, this, but a significant proportion of the revenue ca from casinos comes from people who are problematically involved in gambling. 
there's some criticism about the current research. It's the best that we have, but more, more research that coming is going to confirm, again, that a significant proportion of the revenue from casinos comes from problem gambling. That's no different, for example, from alcohol beverage sales. Significant proportion, again, comes from people with gambling, with alcohol problems. So it's not, it's not an isolated phenomenon. Therefore, we need to keep in mind that a significant proportion of casino revenues from a Hamilton venue, should it be built, would come from people struggling with gambling problems. Gambling as a, as a social and health issue is relatively new. A lot of people just don't get it. They don't understand how a person can develop a problem with gambling. So I'm going to try quickly to explain, for example, why people get into trouble with slots. That's the most problematic form of gambling in the province. You have to think of three things, three factors. Factors about the person who gambles, the social and immediate environment, and the gambling activity and the dynamics between the gambler and the game. We know that certain groups are particularly at risk for problem gambling. These include people with family history of addictions and mental health problems, people with pre-existing emotional and mental health issues, people with histories of trauma or abuse, and that's particularly of concern for women, people who are susceptible to boredom or poor impulse control, people with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, social isolation, number of factors. It should be understood that a lot of people just don't understand how gambling really works. There's a lot of myths and cognitive distortions that can fuel a problem with gambling. Belief in luck, belief in systems, belief in talismans like troll dolls are common. Many people believe in this thing called gambler's fallacy. The more you lose, the more likely you're going to win. All of this indicates that people don't understand a fundamental element of a game like slot machines, and that's randomness. An early big win can also feed into the development of misconceptions. And don't think that, that that misunderstanding about gambling just applies to people with gambling problems. About a third of us, a third of us in Canada believe that our retirement is going to be subsidized from the proceeds of gambling. It's a ridiculous notion. People don't understand the odds. So we're talking about a lot of people who are vulnerable, but there are other factors. The speed of play and continuous nature of slot machine play is a big factor. Players on mo modern video machines can complete a game in as little as three seconds. There is virtually no pause between plays and virtually no opportunity to process what has happened. The intermittent nature of reinforcement of rewards that are involved with activities like slot machine play are also powerful in getting people to do something and keeping them do to do it. Slot machines also feature near wins that actually don't represent the real outcome of the play. Multi-line machines that are now standard in the gambling industry also present losses disguised as wins. In other words, the machine will go off with lights and sounds even though you win less than you bet. Research out of the University of Windsor points out to the problematic impact that this can have on the player. So there are all these structural characteristics of slot machines can, that can lead people to develop serious problems with gambling. In addition, the sensory effects of the games in the casino environment, the lights, the sounds, the colors, stimulate certain parts of the brain and can lead many people to a dissociative state that some people call the gambling zone. The state can impair judgment and can be especially addictive for people looking for an escape. Robert, about another minute, please. There are a number of harm mitigation strategies that can be taken that we endorse should a decision be made to build a casino here on, in Hamilton. However, it should be understood that those measures would only reduce the negative impacts to a certain degree. And actually, there's no agreement on the part of the gambling industry to introduce all of those measures. I believe Dr. Richardson is going to talk about uh, some of those harm mitigation strategies. Thank you again for inviting me to speak. individuals that want a piece of paper and a pencil to write down a question. So 
Uh, we're going to start to uh, hand that out right now, not only in this room, but also out in the atrium so that we can start to get your, your questions. Uh, if you could indicate your name and where you're from as well with that question, we'd greatly appreciate that. And I will now turn the floor over to Dr. Elizabeth Richardson. I hope your voice holds up, Elizabeth. I know you're struggling with a bit of a cold right now, but uh, you have about eight minutes. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. I'm going to do my best. Uh, my apologies if I start to fade out. I'll try to get it back as we as we go, but I'll get as close to the mic as I can so people can hopefully hear me. So gambling, um, as people know, is um, something that has been well described here by Robert tonight, but you might be wondering why is public health is, um, interested in the issue of gambling? And um, it has really become an issue from a public health perspective as gambling has expanded both within Ontario and Canada and worldwide over the last 30 years, which has increased the rates of participation in gambling as well as increased the numbers of people who have problems, who are problem gamblers and have the kinds of problems that Robert's been talking about. So problem gambling is when somebody has either the continuous or periodic loss of control over that gambling behavior. They are uh, preoccupied with gambling, they may be preoccupied with the money to gamble, um, they start to develop rational thinking and this continues despite adverse consequences, things happening that are not good to them and their family. Um, from, a, from a public health perspective, we look at things um, across a broad sort of range of factors, social, health, and, and economic, and we are um, interested in looking at how we can help people maintain healthy behaviors. We know the participation rate um, in Ontario is about 66% from uh, some of the more recent survey data around gambling, So, and most of those people will um, not be having any issues with gambling, and indeed the issues happen on a spectrum. Some people don't gamble at all, some gamble infrequently, some have more problems with gambling and those can be mild, moderate or severe. So when we look at that prevalence overall, we're looking at about somewhere between 1 and 3.4% of people have problems with gambling that are in that moderate to severe category. And we're interested in helping people stay in that healthier zone and continue with those responsible gaming habits or those who do develop, response, develop problem ga problems with gambling to mitigate or decrease the harms that, are, that happen to them and to their families and to the community and move them back into a, into a more responsible responsible zone. In terms of the, the ways we look at doing that, we don't just focus on the individual. We don't. We know when we look at many health problems, it's not just the individual we need to look at. It is those environments, their policies that can influence um, how a person deals with a particular issue, particular issue, whether that's gambling or anything else. And we think those are really important when it comes to reducing harms. Robert's already spoke to the issue of, um, of the profit issue and, and that is something. One of the things to just mention is that you'll see that there's a lot of studies that have been done in this area. And um, when you look at those studies, studies will show a range of impacts, a range of uh, information. And it's not surprising that one study will show one thing and another something else. What's very important to do is to look at all those studies and look at them together and see what they show you when you look at it all together. And that's what Toronto Public Health did when they published their study earlier last year. And um, that's what we do when we look at science. So it's not surprising that you'll hear from some different perspectives uh, coming forward. As Robert said, he talked about some of the impacts on the individual from problem gambling. And um, he also talked about some of those risk factors for problem gambling. I just want to round it out with some others we've seen in the literature. Youth are also at risk of problem gambling. Men are more at risk at, of problem gambling. As he said, those with financial challenges, people from low income are uh, at higher risk, those who've had an early win, and also older adults. There are some environmental factors which do increase the likelihood of people developing problems with gambling. Robert's talked about the gambling environment. There's also the issue of accessibility to gambling. The closer it is, the more likely, likely people are to participate. As people participate, the number of problem gamblers will rise. As well, there's the issue of proximity and uh, as well as just the plain availability. So the closer to you are to it, the easier to access, the more likely it is to happen. The gaming mode, as Robert's discussed, is important. Electronic gaming machines, slot machines, and the like are more likely to uh, lead to problem gambling. 
the operating policies that you put in place in that environment, um, whether they're the number of hours a, uh, a casino is open, the access to money on the floor, um, clocks. It's really important when you talk about supporting people to do responsible gaming behavior that they be able to monitor the time they're playing and not have too close an access to money. And alcohol presence on the floor is also an issue. I'm going to go on and talk a little bit more about those health impacts. So when we look at problem gambling, we see um, a number of impacts on both a mental health level, a physical health level for the individual who's involved, but we also see impacts on the family and on the communities. There's an association in problem gamblers with depression and anxiety, as well as, um, as was described, uh, ADD or attention deficit disorder, personality disorders. Overall, problem gamblers have about um, a 35 percent rate of them have a feeling of, of mental well-being so most of them don't as opposed to the rest of the population of non-problem gamblers where it's about 75 percent. One of the most distressing issues is the issue of suicide and so when we look at problem gamblers about 38 percent of them have attempted suicide, have had sorry suicidal thoughts and about 20 percent have attempted suicide and I'm going to talk a little bit more about youth in a minute, but amongst youth that rate is even higher at about 25% having made an attempt. Um, substance abuse is also an issue. Uh, people who are problem gamblers also tend to um, be addicted to tobacco and they tend to have problems with alcohol and um, uh, other illicit drugs. And that varies from the studies anywhere from 20% to over 50%. From a physical health standpoint, problem gamblers tend to f feel poorer health, just as they do with mental health, tend to be more susceptible to colds and flus, headaches, sleep problems. A lot of this is related to the stress that is involved with problem gambling. And part of it as well is the amount of time they spend in gambling. Problem gamblers spend a lot of time at that activity. They therefore don't have a lot of time to spend at other leisure activities and things that promote the feeling of health and well-being, including exercise, sleep, and, the, and healthy eating. From a family perspective, one of the biggest concerns of problem gambling is the financial impacts. It varies from occasionally not being able to meet commitments like the rent or uh, hydro bills to financial crises where people have spent their life savings, their retirement savings, or going to bankruptcy. And you can imagine then the impacts that it can have on the family. Um, you know, the stress related to the financial issues, issues of debt, um, there's uh, often issues in terms of, of the the hiding of the uh, the activity and the relationships um, suffer a lot of stress. There's an increased rate of uh, family breakdown and those sorts of things. There's also some concern about child development in those situations. The community itself, um, because of the issues of alcohol and fatigue um, related to, uh, to problem gambling, there can be an increased rate of traffic accidents and impacts on employment. Everything from lateness and absenteeism through to illness and uh, theft. I mentioned youth already, that is a particular concern um, with youth having grown up in an environment where there's much more exposure to legalized gambling. We're not sure what that impact will be in the long term and um, with that increased rate of suicide attempts amongst youth, it's uh, particularly something we want to monitor over the longer term. So when we brought forward our report to council, and I'll wrap it up with this, Chris, we brought forward um, just look at, requesting that a public health approach be taken, that this be looked at from the standpoint of what could be done on um, a number, num number of levels to help sustain healthy behavior and help mitigate the harms, reduce the harms to those who might become problem gamblers. So we recommended a suite of operating policies consistent with what you've already heard tonight. And also also recommended to continue with the research not only on the specific issues themselves to, to shed further light but also on what actually happens as the uh, gambling expansion takes place. Thanks very much. Thank you very much uh, Dr. Elizabeth Richardson. Again for those uh, that's our medical officer of health uh, and so Hannah, yes. This is Professor Hannah Holmes from the Department of Economics who's going to speak to some of the economic consequences of, uh, of a casino. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Just right off the bat, so you know, I actually don't live in Hamilton. I live in Thorold. I do 
clearly work in Hamilton. I do spend a lot of time here. So I'm hoping what I say to you comes from a place of objectivity and academe as opposed to having any vested personal interests in whether or not a casino right, uh, becomes reality in the Hamilton area. Uh, what I have done, first of all, uh, I looked at reasons that you would want to have a casino and some of the reasons why you would not want to have a casino from economic views and then I sort of came to my own conclusions with respect to Hamilton in particular. So first of all, I'll start what is generally accepted in uh, the scholars, scholarly research as good things about a casino, why you would want one. Uh, right off the top, uh, universally it's accepted that casinos are a good source to draw in tourism dollars. In fact, the drawing of tourism dollars is probably the most important force that drives the success of a casino. You need foreigners, people who don't live in the area, visitors coming in, spending their money here, and then going back. Okay, We need to keep um, domestic local spending local, not in the casinos. So when you do have tourists come in and spend that money, that's when the casino can be successful. You're not taking money out of local hands that could be spent somewhere else. Um, the creation of jobs, of course, is always good. Uh, as long as they are good jobs, casino jobs you know, are inarguably good, nice places to work for the most part. They do pay better than many minimum wage jobs. Uh, one of the problems is that they are generally unskilled jobs. Okay? We do not invest in the training of workers who develop more skills that would add to their human capital. Okay, um, uh, there are also spillovers right, into the local economy. For businesses that are located uh, near a casino, you could enjoy extra business in the form of restaurant revenues, uh, nearby entertainment venues could see some more activity generated because of the presence of the casino. At the same time, right, the presence of the casino and any uh, entertainment value beyond just the gambling that's included in the complex could also hurt local businesses by drawing people away from your local restaurant. Right, you're going to the casino now, right? So people are spending their money there instead of in their local neighborhoods. So again, right, it depends. Now certainly in economics we like that the consumer has a choice, so one of the positive things about having a casino is it does provide another option for residents with respect to entertainment. Uh, local residents can gamble locally instead of going somewhere else. Right, so. The, uh, any spillovers effect would occur locally. Um, another plus is infrastructure. That adds value, whether it's new infrastructure with the creation of completely uh, new buildings, uh, cap physical capital, or something updated depending on where and if the casino is going to be built. And of course the benefit from new infrastructure is maximized when it's financed by non-local sources. You don't want to redirect money that would normally be spent locally into the building of a new casino complex when that money could also be spent somewhere else. You're not spending new money. Economies thrive when you can create new money. If you're just substituting spending in one area for spending in another area, that's not new money and that will not lead to economic growth. Um, there has also been much research that the impact of a casino in particular, casinos are the most studied forms of gaming in the academic literature. Um, the impact of casinos right, will be much larger in smaller regions and any positive effects will be much less in larger regions. Uh, Hamilton seems to be pretty large. So perhaps any positive benefits may not be as great as uh, the proponents suggest they might. Yeah. 
And remember, too, the more that locals gamble, the less they're going to local restaurants, to local stores, supporting local retailers. Okay, in economics, we also speak of things called negative externalities. These are when things happen to innocent bystanders who haven't actually participated in a particular economic activity. Uh, certainly, depending on if and where a casino was located, we'd be subjected to additional noise, traffic, parking congestion, all things that could prove to be very unpleasant for local residents. With respect to problem gambling, uh, members of the panel have done a wonderful job uh, telling you about the social impacts. Of course, there are economic impacts associated with problem gambling. Certainly, it can result in lower productivity for workers who are consumed right, or obsessed with the continuation of their gambling activity. So it can hurt them in the workforce. Um, people who do have to declare bankruptcy or subsequently lose lose their jobs because of their compulsion for gaming. Uh, they will be supported by uh, employment insurance, welfare payments perhaps. If their compulsion for gambling leads them to commit crime, there's a judicial cost of processing. Right? So there are also economic costs involved with problem gambling beyond the social. Um, Again, from a, a purely economic standpoint, uh, right. statistics that I have, which I think um, the Board of Health may find are in tune, uh, but roughly about 78% of gaming customers are 50 years older or older. Um, they're not wealthy. Many of these are fixed income earners. Okay, they're, they're not going to work every day. Whatever they have to live on per month, that's what they have to live on. So by uh, getting them involved and encouraging them to gamble at the casino, I think that could be a big negative on their income that they're ha able to spend. Now, one other point before I give you my final thoughts. Uh, generally, from an economic perspective, firms want to maximize their profits. One way in which they do this is to maximize their total revenues, minimizing costs. Um, from that perspective only, uh, Things that have been suggested with respect to the actual development of the casino complex. Uh, some of these suggestions socially are absolutely very worthy. Right? Um, economically speaking, from the profit maximization point of view, uh, it seems that these measures would go out of their way unintentionally to reduce revenues, which of course would reduce the monies that would eventually get transferred to the municipality. Um, absolutely good for the individuals, but if the goal of bringing a casino is to enjoy revenues from a local casino so that the government can take that money, take their cut, two and a half to five percent, um, whatever the balance is, depending on what the revenues coming in are, and redistribute that income through the economy, then that will only work if the casino does generate a substantial revenue. Okay, and one minute left, so um, quickly my take, a Hamilton casino could only be a success if it could become a destination casino attracting tourists. Right? This, this is not likely to happen in the Hamilton area anytime soon. I think local businesses stand the real possibility of losing out if the locals spend their money at a casino instead of spending it locally in their communities. Okay. Um, 
Other things being equal, um, if you do at some point decide to build the casino, I would suggest that you would build it in Flamborough where they want it. As, as you want. Um, so we have uh, a number of ways in which we're going to get questions asked. Uh, there is a podium here. Those that want to speak at the podium, Mike is going to guide you as to how the line should go. So those that want to come down and speak, that's fine. But while we're waiting for that, I know we've collected a number of uh, cards from you, so we have some specific written questions, which are wonderful. Uh, but just to start this off, I, I understand we're ready to, uh, to take a, a question or a comment from a phone-in uh, participant. So we're going to shift to that. I'm going to say this, though, folks. Uh, it's important because we have so many people that likely want to talk tonight. Um, could we keep your question or comment to a minute? Uh, I think that's critical. And as focused as your question can be, I think that's ideal. And if you have a panelist that you want to direct it to, I think that's, uh, that's equally important. So with that, if we can shift over over to the individuals that are uh, that are tying into this session by phone. Let's do that. So our moderator, Eric, who's uh, manning the phones, if we can start with that, that'd be great. Thank you very much, Chris. Now for all the people joining us. Or Plan B. Are we ready to go by phone? Simply press on your phone keypad. Place our virtual line to ask that question. Okay. So while we work that out, I'm going to ask this gentleman who's at the podium ready to go to state his name. Where are you from, sir? And what is your question or comment? A minute, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Ted Mansell. I'm the Executive Vice President of Service Employees International Union Local 2. We represent the employees of Flamborough Downs. And as I look around this room tonight, as I did last night in Waterdown, I see a lot of no's, I see a lot of yeses, and if the local had had more time, I would have brought my own sign that said yes and no, because all of these seem to be a very controversial issue around the downtown core. And we're here to tell you, as you had heard earlier tonight from the guest panel, over 4,200 jobs, direct and indirect, rely on Flamborough Downs and a successful slots casino operation. It seems to me that this community is very divided over a downtown casino. And the obvious choice in my mind, as the last speaker just said, is you can have your cake and eat it too. You can keep away the ills that people seem to be worried about with the downtown core casino while still protecting 4,200 jobs. Remember, the OLG has said a casino... A casino has been estimated to generate 400 to 600 jobs. If we don't get the Ford, if we don't get the casino at Flamborough, we will lose over 4,000 jobs. That is not an economic business case a for question. a downtown casino. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are we ready to take a telephone question? Okay, let's go to the telephone right now, please. 
Hi, uh, Mr. Chairman. Chris. Now, for all the people joining us virtually on the phone, uh, we want to remind you that if you have a question, uh, you can simply press 3 on your phone's keypad. You'll be placed in our virtual line of to ask that question live. So we're going to go to our first question from our virtual forum. This is coming up from Phyllis. Phyllis, please go ahead with your question for the panel. Hello, Phyllis. You're joining us live on the forum. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna give this one more shot here, folks. This is a Hamilton invention here, so don't. Uh, <laughs> if you know what I mean. One more try, because we have a gentleman waiting here. So you know what? We're going to give this a second try in a few minutes. Sir, if you could state your name and your question. And so I just want to really focus here, folks. If yep. it's a comment, that's fine. If it's a question, yes, that's sir. fine. A minute, please. Thank you, sir. Your name and where are you from? My name is Roger Biankin, and I have been a resident 60 years in the city of Hamilton. I like you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Ladies and gentlemen, to give me this opportunity to express my opinion. I see this city of Hamilton in the last 60 years grow like a mushroom, and I'm very proud to be a resident of that. In my mind, in my feeling is a casino in the city of Hamilton, it will be go up. Is it good or not? I, I cannot pass that opinion. I can say it brings a lot of work, a lot of things. I understand Anderson Hospital was sponsored by somebody from the casino. I know that who say no, there is a lot of suffering behind. What I'm saying is there is no life without a problem and there is no problem without a solution. I thank you all. to go to the next gentleman and right after this I'd like to take a question that's been expressed in writing so sir if you could your name your uh, where are you from sir and uh, comment question 60 seconds thank you very much thank you mr. chairman good evening my name is Paul Beck I'm a proud resident of Ward 8 uh, it was raised this evening that approximately four to six hundred jobs would be created. I wondered if anyone from the panel uh, can tell us what kind of jobs are those. Are those entry level jobs? Are those well paying jobs? Uh, and what impact will that have on the community? So I'm looking to the panel. I'm looking for a person that can answer. Maybe someone from OLG. Could but, you answer that? Sure, I'd be happy to speak to that. Um, so there's a there's a variety of positions available in the uh, in the casino, uh, anywhere from uh, frontline positions, whether it be a, a slot attendant or a, an F&B server, um, and then the, it goes up from there. So we've got uh, slot techs. Uh, the techs get paid a little bit more, and the average salaries, uh, you know, they're they're um, they're quite generous in the neighborhoods of, of 15 to 20 dollars on average. Uh, with benefits, we run about 50 thousand dollars on average through uh, through the casino. Uh, there's supervisory positions, uh, management positions, uh, general management positions. So there are a number of positions that are that are in the uh, the operation that are that are skilled uh, jobs, and uh, we look for for folks that have uh, you know a significant uh, educational background, and uh, we also have uh, train of, trainable tasks as well. Uh, Thank you, the, and the Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, no follow-up, sir. Sorry. I want to make sure that uh, we're we're going to get to a lot of people tonight. So uh, if I I don't want to be abrupt, but I, no, I think it's really. I just important. want to comment that I am opposed to the casino, but if you have have to put it somewhere, please put it in Flamborough. Okay. Uh, uh, Paul Johnson to uh, read out one of the questions that was asked by uh, one of our citizens here. Paul? Uh, in, in response to some of the information that, that came out today, a question here for the OLG. Uh, one of the OLG's stated goals uh, is to increase the percentage of Ontario residents who gamble from 70% to 75%. Why does OLG think it's good for more Ontarians to gamble? <laughs> Again, I believe I can answer uh, that one. Um, so You're going like to have any, to speak right into the mic because they can't hear you. Certainly. Um, so, like any business, we we're given the uh, the mandate to provide uh, responsible entertainment to uh, to Ontarians, 
And uh, by increasing our participation, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're looking to put the product where the people are, uh, where our customers are looking to, uh, to have our product. And that's really what we've done uh, through the program. If we were to go back uh, 10 or 12 years in Greedfield, uh, the locations uh, that we have today would not, in all cases, would not necessarily be there today. We would be in, in different locations. And that's all we're trying to do is, is align the, uh, our, our uh, offering. I'm answering the question. That was not the question. Excuse me. Okay, let the gentleman answer the question as best he can. If you need well, it restated, we'll have it restated, but please. I understand the question was, uh, why, are we, why are we looking to increase from 70 to 75%? Was, just, that's what I understood so the question Paul, to be. You could just, sorry let's just, if I just everyone, let's, you know, honestly, listen, let him have a chance to answer the, the question. Thank you. In response uh, to those statistics, so you're quite right, the, the preface was uh, the 70 to 75 percent. The uh, question at the end was, why does OLG think it's good for more Ontarians to gamble? Okay. Again, we believe that gambling is a, um, is, is a form of entertainment that Canadians are looking for. Um, so and that's that the Ontarians are looking for, and we provide that, that product. And as we provide that product where the people are, those numbers will, will increase. Um, we recognize that our, that our customers are, the demographics of our customers, um, there is a significant above the, uh, the age of 50. Uh, the other thing is that we don't want to, um, you know, we're very conscious on the amount that people spend in the casinos. Uh, we agree with uh, the, the fact that there, there are problem gamblers in society and we're doing everything we can in order to, uh, to minimize that. But at the same time, we are offering the product uh, to Ontarians. And okay, if we can, uh, we're going to continue. Okay, Rick, thank you very much, Rick. We are going to move now. Let's build our downtown. You know what? You know what? We can shout. I think I'm, very, I'm very, very, I have a lot of faith in this city. I'm not and you know what? And, and all of us do. The truth is, is that all of us have tremendous faith in the city. All of us are incredibly proud of the fact we got such a great turnout tonight. And so we are very happy about that. I, I would love us to spend the next hour hearing as many questions and comments as possible. You know what? Passion is a good thing. You know, we're not, we got a lot of passion in this town, so we're going we're gonna to try the telephone technology one more time, folks. Where's <laughs> Phyllis? Okay, we're going to try that. Eric, okay, here we go. So this is try number three, and you know... Oh, usually if three doesn't work, then it's out. But anyways, we're going to try. Eric, help us. Thank you very much, Chris, and we're going to go to a question from our uh, virtual forum. This question is coming up uh, from Barbara. Barbara, please go ahead with your question. Hi. Firstly, um, I totally understand the concern. <laughs> with your question. Hang on, folks. I think it's coming. And if I reiterate, firstly, firstly, I would totally, I totally understand the concerns of the medical officer of health. But from a revenue perspective, this is so huge for Hamilton. And I do not think that the casino encourages a person to gamble. So my question is, if we can get to the why question. would anyone not support a casino based on the revenue generated for the city? Okay. So I... I, 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 is that that's more of a comment, or is there a specific question? I, I, I sense that there's a comment there, and uh, if that's okay, 
we're we're going to go to uh, our next uh, person at the. At the but my question is, why would anyone not support a casino in Hamilton? Okay, so that's a, that's the question. Why would anyone not want a casino in Hamilton? So, so it uh, it seems like a rhetorical statement to me, to be quite honest. And uh, I, you know, and you brave souls sitting up there that want to answer that, you know, God love you. Uh, but in, in light of that, uh, I would really I, I appreciate that call. The technology is coming. I think we almost have it here, so I'm encouraged by that. But if I can, just this gentleman that's waiting at the podium uh, patiently. Uh, hi, my name is Eric Gillis. I live in Ward 6 and I'm sorry for that gaffe. I didn't mean to do that. but um, So I watched a presentation in Flamborough last night, much thanks to Joey Coleman for that, and I've observed that the social consequences and aspects related to the construction of the downtown casino were continually discussed as being very pertinent Yet I noticed that there was absolutely no sociology professor or social worker professor for McMaster. I'm a McMaster student, and I know that they have a very good reputation, so I'm wondering why that was overlooked. Uh, I have a second question, and I'll, well, it's more of a comment. I'll try to go through it quickly. I didn't know it would only be a minute. Um, as someone who was born and raised in Hamilton, I've got lots of friends in this great city, and I just want to take a really quick second to tell you about one of them. Um, I'm going to call him John. John's mother has an addiction to gambling. She's taken out a second mortgage on John's house, where he lives, because he's in his youth still. And on top of that, took out a credit card in his name because her debt has gotten to the point where she can't afford anything. She hasn't been paying that credit card debt. And he, he now has a horrible credit rating, and he has $5,000 in debt. So as a result of gambling, my friend has to make the hard decision between choosing to take his own mother to court to restore his, his own credit rating and actually have a future or pay it off himself and ruin his future prospects. I'd just like to address the counselors here today and say please, please don't gamble on our future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Paul, if you could, again, the if you have the name and where they're from and the question or comment, please. Thank you. Unfortunately, Chris, I do not have the name or where they've uh, come from, but this is a question around the uh, the Flamborough and in particular the racing operation there. So just to get our, our uh, panel primed on that. So there are a few questions here uh, all related to that. Why was the funding to Flamborough Racetrack stopped? Who made this decision? And is the Flamborough Racetrack certainly out of business? Thank you. Um, the slots at uh, the funding at Flamborough it wasn't um, discontinued just for Flamborough. It, it's been discontinued for the total province to the total province to all racing. The slots at racetrack program, which funded the majority of the purse money at racing in Ontario, was cancelled in March of 2012 by the Ontario government. Um, and with that, they've, they've uh, put in place a panel called the OMAFRA panel to come up with some solutions for racing. But to be clear, even with solutions from the panel, horse racing in Ontario will be at best about 50% of what it is now. And right at this point in time, racing continues at Flamborough. We'll continue at least until March 31st. But after that, at this point in time, we have no... Uh, uh, no funding available for horse racing. As I mentioned in my speech, 85% uh, of the purses for horses comes from the slots, and that program is cancelled at the end of March. So uh, racing continues right now, but we have no solution beyond March 31st. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, Matt. Uh, hi there, everybody. Um, I just wanted to say right off the top, I'm genuinely pleased to see a full room tonight on both sides, and I mean that. Um, 
I'd be more worried if the room were empty tonight. So I think we all we all should genuinely feel good about that. Um, my name is Matt Jelly. I'm the chair of the Central Neighborhood Association, which is a, is a neighborhood association here downtown, uh, bounded by James Street, Main Street West, Queen Street West, and West Harbor. Um, we've consulted with our residents uh, over the past months, um, and what we've heard back from them consistently is they are not interested in a downtown casino, which is consistent with the referendum that was held in 1997 and uh, the idea was rejected 64% in the old city of Hamilton. Um, but people are familiar with my opinions on the casino. I, I don't necessarily feel the need to reiterate them as an activist um, because I admittedly am not an expert and I think we do need to ask the experts uh, tonight uh, and take that opportunity. Uh, my question is for Dr. Richardson. Um, to what extent does proximity and ease of access to a casino on nearby neighborhoods uh, have on nearby neighborhoods and residents and what profile of resident is most effective and how does that manifest itself? Thank you. So the issue of, of proximity is one that uh, many studies have looked at. There are some studies that will say there's not an issue with it, but in, in talking about it and looking at it in studies overall, proximity is felt to be a factor. Um, there have been different distances looked at, um, depending on the study. There's work out of New Zealand that looks at, you know, within driving distance, walking distance, if you're five kilometers away. Um, so it's difficult to say exactly what that number would be, but certainly the closer you are, the higher rates of participation, and then, you know, if you look at a constant rate of, of problem gambling, you know, related to that, then you'd have increased absolute numbers. Um, in terms of the profile, that's the, the sort of risk factors that, that um, Robert, Murray, and myself talked about. The issue of, of youth, seniors, male populations, lower socioeconomic status, people who've had an early win, people with financial issues. So there's a, a range of contributors that increase the risk of, of problem gambling in particular. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Matt. Uh, we are going to go to a, uh, a, a written question here, if we can, just for a second, so we'll change it up a bit. Uh, question for the OLG. Uh, how much money is raised through OLG and distributed to charities throughout the province? Uh, the amount that's raised by, by OLG, we've consistently uh, earned about $2 billion um, annually that gets turned over um, to the uh, to the Ontario government uh, to be used for uh, for health care uh, education and and, uh, and other priorities specifically uh, for the, the the charities uh, just so I do have a, a correct number I'm, I'm going to turn to my colleague uh, it's uh, the amount of is 120 million dollars annually yeah. We're going to try our phone in if we can. We're, we're getting better, I think. Yes, sir. Eric? Are you there, Eric? I'm here. Thank you, Chris. We have a question coming up, and this question is coming up from John. So, John, welcome to the uh, forum. Please go ahead with your question. How are you doing? Uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but hey, look, uh, the. the Put a casino in the middle of downtown Hamilton. City centre is per probably a pretty good idea, but it will create revenue for the city. It will make money for the city. I mean, what do you want? These people are going out there spending their money with the crack dealers and stuff like that, right, you know? Why do that? Let the crack dealers spend the money in the city, right? Thank you very much, John, for that question. Um, is there someone on the panelists who would like to uh, address that concern? You, you, you have to love it. <laughs> that, I think it was just a comment. So with that, though, sir, if we could, your name and, and where you're... Hi. Excuse me, everyone, let's... let's... Okay, come on, you got to listen to me now. i got to have my say. You're going to have your say, sir. Just um, your name and where are you from, sir? Uh, my name is Gordon Gogo. Okay. I run the old Federal Building in James North. It's been there 165 years. I would like the people, the yes people, to know I've lived in that area. I'm born here 79 years ago. I've loved my city. I grew up here in 1933. I've seen the city go up, go down. I've seen the building store down, which never should have happened. I try to support what I can. But if you put it downtown, you're going to drain every restaurant. You're going to drain everybody. You're going to kill. 
because you know addiction is smoking and alcohol and everything else. But you are going to kill James Street North. Take a walk down James Street. Look at the businesses. Take a walk. Hey, I love my city, my parents and everything else. I used to walk these. But I'll tell you something, it hurt me badly. What the hell's wrong with gambling? I'll tell you what's wrong with gambling. What's wrong with smoking? What's wrong with drinking? It's the same damn thing. It's an addiction. And you know the welfare people that are hurting, they're going to be in there hoping, oh, I'm going to hit the big one. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I'm a retired truck driver, a teamster. I try to support and love my city. I, I try to tell people, you know what? It's a, it's a hard going thing. I don't know how many of you are born in Hamilton or were raised here or where you come from, but I am original. I'm original. I support the man I work for. He's worked hard. He's not even from here, but he supports the city 100%. He backs me up. And all of you here tonight, we're sitting here. What are we doing? Well, like, well, actually, what we're doing, decide we want something downtown, we're going to do this. What in the name of God would you want to come down and destroy Hamilton? You, you know, the city is suffering bad enough. <laughs> hey, what about the Royal Connaught Hotel? It's been sitting there forever. Nobody cares about that, but the Lister Block, it's all done. Guess what? Nobody in there. Hey, we're good. What happened there? <laughs> Your comment. Is there a question in there, or is that is that basically? My question is. <laughs> I want to know if the city is going to go for this. I want to know if they're if they're backing it up. So, I would like to know that. So I, as a citizen I, of no, this city. I think that's a great question. And what, what I said from the outside, outset, outset, um, we have a number of councilors here tonight. They are here to listen to your comments all the comments and questions we're hearing and what our experts are saying they have not made a decision on this matter as a council they will be doing that next month so i expect that we'll probably for that meeting have something maybe as large as this maybe. but it wouldn't be fair for but me to sir, ask what their decision what? would be no these these people as i said they're here to listen tonight i would like us to get because right now we're at eight o'clock and I, I want us to get through as many people as we can as many questions they have not there's no decision being made on this tonight obviously there is going to be a decision made next month. Right now, we're receiving information. We're receiving your comments. We're receiving the comments from our panelists. And if I can go to the next speaker, I think your point is very well taken, sir. Thank you. I love Hamilton. Chris, a, a couple of uh, written questions came in. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who would answer this, but uh, since a couple of them asked this in different ways, I'll choose one. It's worded as, will any public money be used in developing uh, a potential casino in the downtown? Uh, well, I think that question is probably, uh, I don't think there's anyone up here. I can, well, answer, I can okay, answer that. Good, okay, Rick, Rick, sorry. So the, the whole premise uh, behind modernization is, uh, again, not only... Um, you know, improving where our product is, but it's it's in, in how we get there. It's it's providing that opportunity to the the public sector, private sorry the private sector, and uh, it will be the private sector's funding uh, that will build those operations um, in anywhere in the province. So we are opening that up to the private sector and uh, in taking that burden off the Ontario government. Thank you, Rick. Okay, so uh, we're going to try. Hang on here. We're going to try a phone call. The last one worked, so this one will work too, I'm sure. Thanks, Chris. We have another question coming up, but we've also had a few new people join us on our virtual forum, so we'd just like to remind them that if they want to ask a question of their own, they can simply press 3 on their phone's keypad. So we now have a question from Mark. Mark, please go ahead with your question. Hi. I, I uh, am a business owner in Ward 2 and on James Street, and I know the uh, last speaker very well, and I thought he did a great job. I also live in Ward 1 really close, and um, I've been in business now down there for about three years, and I've had a chance to talk to a lot of people in the community about this issue. Um, and But it's not just this issue. What, what I really have been interested in is what's going to you know make, make uh, a more vibrant downtown. 
Um, and the consensus is, with most people who have been there a lot longer than me, is that we need more people living down there. We need people in the lower city. We need a higher density population that will, uh, you know, facilitate revenue, support uh, retail. Retail struggles, you know, to compete with the uh, with the advantages that large mall complexes maybe give up on the mountain and other places. The um, the, the the city needs. And so, in my view, is the city needs more people. Um, is there any study that that suggests that um, you know a, a, a casino environment is going to uh, retract from from you know the the idea of, of 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 moving down into an inner city and make it make it less appetizing for people? This is really my concern because I think that we're at a bit of a crossroad in Hamilton. Uh, there's a lot of people coming from outside that that are interested in this now. There's a lot of investment. Um, there's a lot of coat tailors, and um, you know perhaps the uh, the gaming facility is a bit of a coat tailor. And, and I know there's a you know there's a there's a you know a real desire to make things uh, happen down there and, and get things going. But to me, in the long long run, and I just wonder if people are really looking in the long down down the road future. In the long run, we need more more people down there. And what kind of a, a uh, a, a cog in the wheel, in that wheel would uh, a casino environment or a gambling environment. Okay, if I can, uh, Hannah, do you want to uh, answer that question if you can? Yeah, most of the studies seem to indicate that depending where you place the casino will determine what happens to the surrounding area. Generally, when casinos move into areas that are highly impoverished, they have made a very positive effect. Uh, generally, if you can you know, clean up the city, uh, improve infrastructure in poorer areas, you can make it more habit habitable for new residents to move in. Uh, again, it's... It, it, Okay, but do remember, this will all depend on where the casino is actually located. If you place it in a large downtown area, which is already doing pretty well, uh, it's not going to change much area. Which, yeah, no, I, this is, I didn't mean specifically Hamilton, I meant in general. Thank you, Hannah. If I can, Graham. Uh, yes, this is a question for the OLG. Uh, I, I must say I'm impressed with your ability to collect data. Uh, for whether that's uh, you know average household income or uh, dollars per spend per visit, uh, where people come from when they go into your casinos, uh, I would ask uh, in terms of uh, if we consider the parking lots and adjacent parking lots as well as the washrooms, how many people killed themselves in your facilities last year? Wow. I'm just going to defer to my uh, colleague, uh, Paul Pelizzari. Uh, thanks. I'm going to answer this question for OLG. Uh, my name Paul, is could you uh, introduce who you are? Yes. I'm Paul Pelizzari, Executive Director of Social Responsibility for OLG. Uh, the answer to that question is zero. The word <laughs> The, uh, that is not to understate or underplay the significance of uh, risk for suicide with problem gambling. Um, uh, Robert Murray and the chief medical officer indicated that, and uh, there is a risk with that. So I'm not trying to say that that's not important, because it is. The, we don't track that data. What? But there's, there are, but I, if you don't mind me, there are, there are a lot of. Um, myths out there. Uh, we've been around the province to a number of different places. I've heard 14 people have killed themselves in the Washington of Rama. Not true. I can tell you in the history of OLG casino gambling in Ontario, there have been four suicides either on the property or adjacent to the property um, since uh, it's been operating in 1994. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul, if we can, a question. Question for Dr. Richardson and uh, Robert Murray. A uh, bit of a two-part here. What exactly classifies a risk or problem gambler in the research? And with the rise of legal online gambling, have the statistics that have been mentioned this evening uh, drawn a distinction between online gamblers and those that would frequent a traditional bricks and mortar casino, or are they lumped together? And that comes from Mark uh, from East Hamilton. 
generally speaking, people who have problems with gambling, whether it's pathological or people who are a bit subclinical, spend more than they, they intend, they chase, uh, they experience negative impacts. Uh, that might include bankruptcy, family breakdown, violence. Um, we talked about anxiety, depression, the psychiatric mental health issues that come from having a problem with gambling. We can talk about social isolation. We can talk about a wide variety of, of mental health and social impacts that a person with a gambling problem has. So it, it's, it's, it becomes a pervasive kind of issue for people who have a, this kind of problem. Um, and as we've talked about, it can have serious, serious consequences, especially to the family. There's a, there's a saying that when I drink, I drink with my own liver, but when I gamble, I gamble with my entire family's well-being. Wow, wow. Um, it, there's impacts on employers. Uh, there's, there is impact on the criminal justice system. Um, our, we've done studies in, uh, in prisons that show that 10% of the prison population have an active gambling problem. 15% have a subclinical problem. So, uh, so we're, we're looking at a major social and economic issue. Now, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Uh, was whether the things you're talking about uh, combine online and bricks and mortar gambling or whether there's a distinction. Is there any difference in the research and the, the statistics that you've been sharing between online gambling and uh, bricks and mortar gambling? Yeah, the, the research on online gambling is a bit newer. This is a newer phenomenon. But the, the research that we've seen demonstrates that people who are gambling online have much higher rates of problem gambling. You must understand that we're talking about oftentimes people who are gambling to have access 24-7, the comfort of their home, they can gamble in their jammies with a case of beer beside them. It's isolation, that there's no monitoring. We've got a lot of offshore, illegal, gray market type sites that really don't provide a product in a particularly responsible manner. Um, so that's a concern. Um, so yeah, we're concerned about online gambling and the, the, this, there's two kind of concerns and there's a benefit to the online gambling that's coming here at Ontario that's sponsored by the OLG. In so, the first instance, I think you know, the OLG is stating that they're committed to a very rigorous registration process that's going to really inhibit youth gambling from getting onto the site. They're saying they're also going to be committed to monitoring and intervening when there's evidence of problematic play. So, I mean, there is an opportunity here to effectively, even more effectively than in a casino, intervene with people who are exhibiting problems with gambling because you can monitor them much closer. The downside to it is that this is going to be promoted in a much larger way than it is currently. A lot more people are going to do it because it's government sanctioned. They're going to feel like this is a legitimate thing that they can do. Whereas now a lot of people believe, erroneously actually, that it's illegal to gamble online. And so we're going to increase the participation rates tremendously. And unfortunately, a cohort, a subset of that group of people are going to develop problems. So there's both a pro and a con to online gambling. Thank you very much, Robert. We're going to go to the phone. I understand, Eric, you have a caller on the line. Thank you, Chris. We do have a caller on the line, and we've also had over 23,000 people join us so far this evening on our virtual forum. And we want to remind them that they can ask a question on their phone keypad. But this question uh, coming up is from Debbie. Uh, Debbie, welcome to the town hall. Uh, you are joining us uh, on our virtual forum. Please go ahead, Debbie, with your question. Yes, I want to know that if the casino comes into Hamilton, if they're going to employ the local people of Hamilton, or will people be brought from other cities in and take the work away from the people from Hamilton? Debbie, so, thank you very much for that question. Uh, back to you, Chris. Thank you, Eric. Um, we're going to turn that to Rick. Rick, what has been typically the experience of uh, casinos and who they hire? 
Um, to, to answer the, the question for uh, whether those employees would come from the area, I believe they would. Um, in fact, uh, when you take a look at um, the, uh, the employees that we have across the province, uh, they're doing a phenomenal job. And as we went through the uh, procurement process, or as we're going through the procurement process, rather, uh, the first part of that was um, the request for information where we met with a number of uh, potential operators, and they're quite complementary of the talent that we have in Ontario. And they actually took notes back to their organizations back in, in other areas of uh, North America. Um, so I anticipate that working with the private sector, they would in effect um, you know, employ local, local talent for sure and, uh, and not be looking to bring in a lot of uh, talent from, from outside the area. Thank you, Rick. We're going to go to the podium here. Yes, sir, your name and where are you from? My name is Joseph Maselli. I'm from Hamilton here, Ontario. And my question is to all the people here are carrying a no sign. Do you agree that uh, bingo and buy, buying lot of tickets is a form of gambling? And if so, then why not close those places down? Let's do that! Okay, thank you very much. I think you have your answer. So we're going to go to the next person in line. It's probably a little more honest. If you could state your name and where you're from, please. And you're My name is Melissa Height, and I'm an entrepreneur in Hamilton, Ontario. So um, first, let me clearly state that I'm neither for nor against the casino anywhere. So I just want to, um, I have one minute, and I'm going to say something quick. My mother, uh, this is a personal situation for me, because my mother has... Uh, come very, very close to losing her residence um, through gambling uh, at the Flamborough Casino. Um, and my only concern, and I guess question, would be to the OLG, was something that I didn't know and I found out through that process was that a, a person who suffers from problem gambling cannot ban, um, uh, the family members cannot ban them from going to the casino. They have to ban themselves. And so I guess my question to you, like, like I said, I'm neither for nor against. My biggest concern is my personal family's uh, well-being. So I just want to know, is that policy going to change in terms of can close family members or doctors or someone that says that they are mentally incapable of making that decision ban them from the casino? No. So, Rick, if you can answer that question. Yes, thank you, Melissa. Um, again, I'm going to defer to our uh, responsible gambling expert, uh, Paul Pelizzeri, for that. Um, the answer to that question, there, there are circumstances under which a family member or a loved one can uh, ban someone, and that is if you have power of attorney. So if if uh, if your mother, so if your mother, uh, but if you said if your mother um, isn't of mental capacity to to be able to handle her affairs, and uh, you take over power of attorney, that is the circumstance under which someone else can ban. We appreciate it. It is very hard on family members when someone has a gambling problem, and. Um, we, we've done as much as we can to try to support family members in how they can assist in that situation. Unfortunately, there, there are legal limitations, right? This is about, uh, it's about law, and it's about uh, someone's rights to make their own decisions. Um, uh, what we do, do... Sorry, if I can just say one thing. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, can a bartender cut off a person from drinking? Yeah. And, and I don't, and I don't, I'm not... I'm, 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 it's, it's a very that's a very valid question. So to, to compare beverage alcohol and how it's dealt with and how, how we deal with it. So beverage alcohol, um, a bartender um, can look for signs of intoxication. A gambling problem is invisible. Yes. Right. And that now that that said. That said, we train our staff to look for what we call red flag behavior signs. So this is a method that was developed in conjunction with the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. All of our staff are trained to, to look for these signs. Um, we interact with players if they are showing signs of distress, if they're making certain kinds of comments. We will ban people from the casino if they're showing signs of fatigue impairment. Because that is something, if you look tired. Well, have you? Yes, we do. You actually have done that? We, we ban people from fatigue impairment every year. Cool. Yes. So I just, I, these, these, and yay for the entertainment yeah. aspect of it, I'm yeah. all for that. So these, thank you. These are relatively new developments over the last three years that we've done this, right? So. This, this industry has to change 
because we have a public health mandate. We've uh, done a lot of things to change what we're doing, and going forward, we're going to continue to do that. So um, I hope I answered the question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to uh, we're going to go to the telephone. So Eric, who's on the line? Chris, thank you for that. Uh, we have our next question. Uh, this one is coming up from Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, welcome to the virtual forum. You're live. Please go ahead with your question. Thank you very much for taking my call. Um, my question is for the OLG representatives. Uh, I, first of all, I want to make a statement, and that is um, Paul Godfrey, your uh, uh, leader, uh, recently indicated that he didn't want a casino in his backyard, so why should you expect us to have one in our backyard? I'm a Ward 2 uh, resident, and uh, my property values have been going up. I've been paying a lot more taxes to the city of Hamilton because of that, and I'm very concerned about my property values uh, declining because of a, a casino. Uh, so that's just a statement that I want to make. But my real question is, can you tell me which current OLG vehicle or product group generates the highest dollars for the provincial coffers at this time? Um, I know what it is, but I want to hear it from you. Rebecca, thank you very much for that question. Uh, back to you, Chris. Okay, Rick, can you answer that question? Sure. The uh, the largest amount is the uh, is the lottery product. Thank you, Rick. So we're going to go to a written question, if you don't mind, Paul. Thank you. Sure. Question for the deputy chief. Uh, the information that you provided, does the calibration of the, the costs and, and the impacts I would take by extension of that, consider the impacts beyond the casino facility into the neighborhoods that surround a casino facility? I did mention in my, uh, my briefing that there is no data that shows that any of the uh, activities from the casino action can go into the neighborhood. Um, and so, like we're talking about domestic situations, uh, suicides, again, there's no data that ties it back to the casinos. However, uh, there is research that shows that the types of crimes that are happening around casinos are auto thefts, pedestrian traffic, uh, vehicle traffic, collisions, uh, and disturbances in intoxicated persons. And that's uh, right across the board that we've seen uh, certainly in Ontario. So uh, you're going to definitely see an impact on traffic. You're going to be definitely see an impact on uh, probably theft from autos, uh, that kind of incidents. But if you look at the Flamborough experience, again, uh, Flamborough, of course, uh, not quite as populated. Uh, 750 occurrences in six years. It's about 110 occurrences a year. We don't expect to see that much activity uh, in the downtown core, but of course that still has to be uh, weighted out um, as it develops. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy Chief. So if I, I'll go to the podium right now, and then after that we're going to go to the telephone, and uh, and then Paul, you again. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Chris. You're doing a great job. And just as a point of observation for those people at home, most of the yes people have left. So if you're using, if if you're here and you'd still like a seat, there's plenty left. So those people that are out in the hall, they're sitting on the floors. Please come on in and sit down. There's lots of seats left. So my question is to the OLG, respecting democracy and respecting the decisions that have already been made here in council, referring back to the April decision to support a Flamborough location, if our city council says no to a downtown casino, but yes to a casino at the present Flamborough Downs location, how specifically will the OLG respond? Again, I'll, I'll uh, repeat what I said earlier. We, Flamborough Downs is a, is a very successful uh, location, um, and we have a great working relationship with uh, Great Canadian uh, Gaming. Uh, should Council uh, decide to choose only that location, um, basically uh, reducing the zone to a, a single building, again, we're a tenant in that building. It's going to limit the, uh, the number of choices for the private sector. Uh, so I think we'd end up having to go back and just, just take a look at that, that zone. So are you saying you would change the rules then? Uh, no, I'm not saying we'd, have, we'd change the rules. We'd have to go back and, and take a look at it. So I, I can't, I'm not in a position to commit one way or the other tonight. Okay, thank you very much. So with Paul, if you could give us a question. This comes from a lifelong Hamiltonian with the initial K. 
Statistics indicate that casinos in densely populated areas have increased addictions of all kinds, uh, poverty, violence against women. The city is already struggling to fund programs to deal with these issues. Since the province won't be footing the bill, what plans are in place to fund the programs that will deal with the inevitable increase in addiction, poverty, and violence against women? Uh, maybe more suited for the right side of the panel on, on, on mine, are there any uh, plans, what have other communities done in terms of, of dealing with some of the, uh, the issues that emerge? Well, I think we have to anticipate that those costs are going to be incurred. Uh, it's one of the social impacts that oftentimes doesn't really get well uh, recognized. I don't know whether you have any economic quantification. To, to say, you know, what's, what's the plan is, I don't know that there is. You know, we, that's, it's part of the economic costs of gambling that I don't think actually gets, gets well recognized. So we're going to go to, uh, appreciate that response, Robert. If we're going to go to the phone, uh, Eric, do you have someone on the line that uh, has a question for us? And if they could state their name and where they're from, from that would be fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we do have a question, and again, I'd like to thank you uh, to the people joining us on our virtual forum. Over 24,000 people so far this evening. If you'd like to ask a question of your own, simply press 3 on your phone's keypad. Now, uh, welcome to Mike, who's joining our discussion with a question. Mike, please go ahead. Mike, hello. Welcome to the virtual forum. You have a question. Please oh, go ahead with oh, it. Oh, hi. Uh, <laughs> you sort of struck me here uh, by surprise. Uh, my concern is, and I, and I appreciate Mr. Jelly, uh, 1997 we had a, uh, a chance to have the old Eaton Center, which is, of course, an abandoned building downtown, to turn into a casino. And I 100% supported that. Uh, now we come to this stage of the game, and and I'll be honest with you, my wife and I go to Falls View once a month. We spend at least one or two thousand dollars. Fortunately, we can afford it. However, for those who cannot support it or cannot afford that, why would we not want that revenue of millions of dollars a year to help these people? Uh, you know, stop from their addiction. And I, and, I, and I gotta be honest with you, we first went to the casino, we maxed out every credit card, and then we, you know, you know, the light hit the, it, the light hit us. Uh, you know, we, we respond, you know, we, 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 we gamble what we can afford. But I would say like 200, you, to the no people, and, and I can understand their concerns, but $250 million to begin with in the core of this city, like that is, you know, I don't know. A anyway, I, uh, that, that, you know, that's my opinion. And No, we appreciate know, that. That's, like uh, I appreciate that comment. So if I could go to the podium here, sir, uh, your name and where are you from? My name is Dan Jelly. I'm the other Mr. Jelly, not the one that the previous caller was referring to. Um, I just want to take a second to thank all the councillors for being here. It's, it's late for them, too, and, uh, and eight of you were at Flamborough last night. It was really cool. Um, where's the mayor? Certainly, the deputy mayor is here tonight, yes, uh, as you. well as his Where chief of staff is here. Uh, so he is certainly through uh, deputy mayor and chief of staff is is hearing all the comments mm -hmm. and questions. But uh, okay, I, I, I do have a question. Um, I do have a question for the OLG. Um, your CEO, Rod Phillips, came and presented to council, and that was uh, very helpful. He was here and told us that uh, by moving the casino from Flamborough downtown, we could see perhaps 10% uh, additional revenue. Uh, what reasons do you have for, to not believe Mr. Phillips? I don't have any reasons not to believe Mr. Phillips. I believe that's certainly attainable. Okay, so excuse me. We're yep. gonna, it, it's one question and comment. We're, we're, I don't want to stretch right. it too much because I see a line behind you, and I know we got lots of written questions and a number of people on the phone. So just ten percent. Thank you. That's all I needed. Thank you very much. Okay, if we can, Paul. With tax bases and industry leaving the city, how are we going to fill the gap? The question is, uh, could a casino fill that gap? 
So if we could through to you, Helen, uh, as you put your coat on. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I was thinking about Hannah, getting home at this Hannah. late hour. What was the question? Paul, the, could you repeat the question for Hannah, please? Thanks. Uh, with the tax base and industry leaving this city, how are we going to fill the gap is the preamble uh, or question there. And, and uh, can a casino fill this gap? Is there evidence to support that? Uh, no evidence whatsoever to suggest that a casino can support that. Excuse me, we're going to try the, uh, the telephone again. So Eric, if you have someone on the line, please. We do have a question uh, coming up, and this question is from uh, Valeria. Valeria, welcome to our virtual forum. Uh, please go ahead with your question. Did you Valeria. say Valeria? Yes. Valeria? It's, it's, yes. it's Valerie. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Please go ahead with your question. <laughs> that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, I have a question in regards to Hamilton and its history, that it used to be an industry-based city. Um, my question is, is the money that would be um, generated by a casino in Hamilton, would it be going back into the Hamilton to increase industry, or would it be going back into Hamilton for civil service wages, um, which don't produce anything? <laughs> Valerie, thank you very much for that question. Hurt. Valerie, uh, please, Chris, back to you. <laughs> um, the, uh, I'm the moderator, so I won't answer that question. <laughs> uh, well, to be quite honest, I, 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 uh, Hannah, I'm not going to, I don't know if you can answer that question. It's a heck of a question. No, you can't really answer that. That's going to be up to whoever controls the purse strings, which will be the government. Right. Your name, sorry about that. Your name and where you're from? And yes. Question. Good evening. My name's Ned Nolan. I'm a lawyer in Hamilton. I work downtown. I can't believe that the frenzied pursuit of profit, often cloaked as development or progress, has reached such a peak in our society that we may be willing to sacrifice people's lives and families on its altar. We know about the social costs, and no one's really doubting whether they are real or not. They're very real. We have entire departments of universities which study them. So we can forget for a second about the impact on the arts, impact on small business, uh, impact on the very amazing revitalization that is happening right now in downtown. Um, and we can, we can forget about, for a second, about the 3,400 jobs in Flamborough, but are we so divorced from our fellow human beings that we're willing to endorse the real social costs so that people can make some money? I think that's crazy. I have a very quick question. I have a quick question, and it's for the OLG. We've heard tonight uh, from Dr. Richardson her recommendations about limiting the operating hours of your facilities uh, between the hours of uh, 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., and I'm wondering if there are any OLG facilities in Ontario uh, with those restrictions in place, and if not, why is the OLG um, intentionally exposing people to a higher risk? Thank you. Thank you. in terms of listening, okay, and so I'd like to hear the answer to that question, then I'm going to ask the question about how much longer uh, do we want to spend tonight, because we are officially out of time as of 8.30, we did have more time last night, uh, but 9 o'clock probably is a reasonable time to... Uh, to, to cut it off, but Rick, if you wouldn't mind answering that question. Certainly, I, I don't believe any of our, our properties uh, today have those hours specifically. Um, however, uh, we do offer the, the product based on what the, uh, the customers are asking for. Uh, we recognize that uh, not every individual has the same schedule through the course of a day or through the course of a week, and uh, we adjust our, our product offering accordingly, and uh, we have adjusted uh, hours based on that. Thank you very much, Rick. So are, are we okay until 9 o'clock? Is everyone all right for that? Okay. 
So I, I'm going to go to the podium here, and uh, your name, and uh, where you're from, and your question or comment, Okay, please. my name is Patricia Veralje, and I'm from Stony Creek, and my, actually my question has just been answered. She walked out the door. She didn't show up last night. I'm specifically going to ask her a question, whether she's researched or ever consulted or published any papers. So obviously, she hasn't. She left. Thank you. Sorry, excuse me. Excuse me. I think, no, no, I think in fairness to, to the professor, I mean, we had scheduled, you know, people have scheduled their, their lives around certain events, and so she could only stay till 8.30, so in fairness to the professor. That's why the have a job. You know, no, no. You know what? Let's, no, no, folks. You know what? You, you've done, as I say, you've done fantastic. So let's. Uh, I have. Whether any of my staff can answer that, I, I think in, in choosing these individuals, uh, we are careful to make sure that they are subject matter experts. The fact that she's a professor. Do we? Do we have an answer? Okay, we're going to go to the next question. It's a comment that uh, we appreciate what you're asking, but if we can go to Paul. The question is, what percentage of revenue is anticipated to be generated at the proposed downtown Hamilton casino by people living outside of Hamilton? So maybe a question in general, have there been studies or uh, investigations done on what is in city versus out of city? Um, at this point, uh, not yet. That'll become part of the, the process. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier that, that we had run a uh, request for information, uh, met with, with uh, a number of uh, potential service providers, got their input. We've now gone out with uh, wave one of our RFPQ process, uh, which will look for uh, the private sector. Uh, the next step is... Um, is uh, going to the uh, to the uh, uh, into the uh, RFP stage. Um, if you can bear with me for one moment. At that point, we will be working with the the private sector. Um, in order to uh, submit uh, proposals. So they'll develop plans around how they wish uh, the facility within uh, the zone uh, to be built and then we'll be evaluating uh, those proposals. So it's difficult at this point to determine uh, exactly where the customers will come from, uh, how much, you know, what percent will come from uh, the immediate Hamil Hamilton area and which uh, will come from tourism uh, in other, other parts of Ontario. Thank you very much, Rick. We're going to try Eric on the phone. Is there someone wanting to ask us a question, Eric? Thank you, Chris. We do have uh, another question ready to go on the line on our virtual forum. We have over 50 questions waiting to be asked on our virtual forum, so thank you for your patience, everyone. Our next question coming up is Anne. Anne, welcome to the, uh, our virtual forum. Please go ahead with your question. Anne, welcome to the, uh, our virtual forum. Please go ahead with your question. Anne, are you there? Please go ahead with your question for our virtual forum. Anne, are you there? Please go ahead with your question for All right. We'll try and get another question on the line. As I said, we do have quite a number of people ready to go on our virtual forum. So our next question is going to be coming up from Ivy. Ivy, welcome to the virtual forum. We're going to go to your question now. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. And I'd like to make a comment, please. And I would appreciate it if I could finish the comment before you start to hollering at me. Uh, my question is, when are we going to start blaming the individual? We are blaming the drugs, we are blaming the alcohol, and we are blaming the casinos. In the case, case in point, John, his mother, that was her bad parenting that is costing that kid. They did not drag her into the casino. She willingly went in. We need to place the blame where it lies, on the individual. Thank you very much. Okay, if we could uh, go to the next gentleman at the podium here. Sir, if you wouldn't mind, you state your name, where you're from. My name's Rod Burns. I was born and raised in Hamilton. I have a question for the OLG. Um, how many casinos are you planning on opening, and how many bingo parlors are you planning on opening? The, uh, the number of new um, casinos is, is five. We're looking to put one in, in Kenora, uh, one in North Bay, one in the Wasaga, uh, Collingwood area, um, one in the Belleville and Quinty area, and then one in the, in the GTA. Um, as for, uh, for bingo, 
I'm going to defer to uh, my colleague, Tony Batonti. My name is Tony Batonti. I'm the Senior Manager of Communications at OLG. In terms of bingo, uh, there are currently 61 bingo halls in operation in Ontario. The option that they have right now is do they want to be part of a revitalization program? It is the bingo hall and the associated charities and the municipality that will decide that. Um, if these bingo, if these municipalities don't want that to happen, it won't, or the bingo halls or the charities. Um, right now we have one phase that's being rolled out. There's about 12 halls. Um, there is another phase that it, we're starting consultations on that phase with a, about 12 or 13 more halls. Uh, but again, that's very early in this process. Um, again, and again, there, was, there, there are a total of 61 in the province, but not all of them will be part of the bingo revitalization program. Thank you very much for your question. So as everyone can see, Mayor Bertina is here. And so, thank you, Mr. Bert, uh, Mayor Bertina. Uh, Paul, if we can, just... Uh, Another written comment? Or I'm going to combine where I can. So this is uh, in relation to Flamborough Downs. And uh, uh, Mark from Hamilton has, uh, has a question that he's heard that if there's a downtown casino, it will shut down Flamborough Downs. And is this the case? And related to that, if Flamborough Downs is moved to another location, what will happen to the jobs of the people who work there now? So uh, we can combine those two together on the Flamborough Downs question. Uh, thank you very much. The, on that two-part, uh, if there's a downtown casino uh, and there's no um, government support for racing, there definitely will be no horse racing at Flamborough Downs. It's not simply a matter of just where the casino is located. It's also support for purses, etc. Uh, on the question of will the jobs still be there, um, they wouldn't specifically be at Flamborough Downs, but could they be at another, at the new casino? That would be up to who the operator of that casino would be. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go to the phone right now. And the Eric, who do you have on the line? Thanks, Chris. Uh, we do have another question coming up. Uh, this one uh, on our virtual forum is from Danielle from Ward 8. So, Danielle from Ward 8, please go ahead with your question. My question is in the comment, it's more or less basically if you want winning downtown, how about using the Royal Canox as the casino, because that way you have rooms upstairs for our visitors, as well as you have the large lobby, you have the great uh, dining area, plus all the uh, conference rooms that can be used. So I believe that would be even spice up the downtown, bringing more people to come in and more more business, more uh, tourists. So this is my best comment, and I've been hoping to be able to say, say this. So thank you. And we appreciate that. Uh, you, sir, uh, to the podium, your name, sir, and uh, where you're from? My name is Igor Kostrzewski, and uh, I live in Ward 3, and I work right here downtown, actually, Kitty Corner from City Hall. Uh, I have a short comment first, and then I have a question for the OLG salesman. Um, the comment is... Uh, I'm actually really disappointed with some of the commentary that I'm reading in the spec from some of the councillors. It is really, really logic deficient. How we as a city are confident that we can mitigate the impact of a casino against the advice of mental health professionals, but we cannot mitigate the, the impact of something as simple as urban chickens that have generated three complaints in the city of Guelph really undermines my confidence in the city and staff. And for the OLG, I have a question as to how uh, can the OLG say that they are respecting the consultation process mandated by the province when by killing the slots at Flamborough without any consultation, they are putting this council basically ransoming jobs. They either approve a casino or say goodbye to local jobs. I want to know how, are, how do they think they are respecting the consultation process when putting a gun to the head of city council? So 
certainly. Uh, again, the, the slots at racetrack program, um, th that program itself uh, was ended by the, the government. That wasn't our decision. That was a, actually a, a policy decision. <coughs> So if I can, just before we go to the next person, which I think will go to the telephone line, but I just want to mention here that Councillor Jackson uh, is, uh, is at a library, or uh, is at a library meeting tonight, and if it wasn't for that, otherwise he would be here. So if we can, I'd like to go to Eric. Eric, who do you have on the line? Thank you, Chris. Uh, we now have Tina on the line. So Tina, welcome to our virtual forum. Uh, please go ahead with your question. Hi, um, I'd like to start off by saying that I'm um, not opposed to a casino in the city of Hamilton, um, in anywhere in Hamilton. Uh, I just would like the government of Hamilton to maybe reconsider the location. However, um, my question is that I've heard the chief medical officer suggest that perhaps we ensure that the facility is closed for a minimum of six hours a day and that we eliminate um, ATM machines from any facility. And I'm wondering whether you guys would consider that at OLG and whether you would um, implement something of that nature. Tina, thank you for that question, and back to you, Chris. Yes, uh, I know she directed it at Elizabeth. I know it's our decision at the end of the day, or councils, but Elizabeth, do you have any comment to make on that? Chris, I believe it was directed to OLG. Oh, sorry. Okay. Again, I'm going to uh, defer to my colleague, uh, Paul Pelizari. Okay. Um, we've heard uh, and we've received uh, the City of Hamilton's health recommendations and we are evaluating all of them. Um, we will be um, coming back to the City with our responses to all of those particular requests. Wonderful. Okay, if we can, we're going to go to the telephone and then after that we'll go to you, Paul, with the next written question. So, Eric. Thank you, Chris. We have another question. Uh, we still have a number of people waiting on the phones to uh, have a, their questions, have a chance to get heard. And here's another one. This one is from Lisa. Lisa, welcome to the virtual forum. Please go ahead with your question. My name is Lisa Alway, and I live in Hamilton, and I'm calling from home. And I just wanted to say that I think a casino would be the greatest thing Hamilton ever ever saw, and it would be the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I think. Yeah, hey, thank I think you very much for that. Uh, if we can, we're going to go to the next uh, speaker at the podium. Yes, sir. Your name and, and where you're from, sir. Good evening. Uh, Good evening, uh, councillors, respected councillors, panelists, citizens. Uh, my name is Vikram Singh. I'm a lawyer in Hamilton. My question uh, is uh, a multi-pronged with respect to the advantages and or disadvantages from moving the casino from Flambra, where it presently states in this jurisdiction, on the grounds of the impact it has, uh, uh, and this is direct to different members of the panel, uh, with respect to uh, law enforcement, the advantages and or disadvantages that you may foresee with respect to moving this casino uh, from Flambro to the downtown core. With respect to uh, the commercial advantages and or disadvantages, uh, the question is directed uh, towards our respected panels from the OLG, uh, from, again, moving it from the uh, Flambro uh, location to the downtown core and uh, to our uh, third segment or third area, uh, which we may call the social impact or the education impact uh, from moving it uh, from the uh, Flambro location to the downtown core. Uh, if any of the panelists could comment uh, with respect to uh, what they see uh, in their mandate as those factors uh, uh, proposing this as a, uh, as a location. Thank you. I don't know who wants to start with that, but uh, I look to all of you. Any of you? I'd, I'd be happy to start uh, from okay, a commercial right. standpoint. Um, so I think some of the advantages are you're you're moving into a uh, um, higher uh, population uh, with a with um, a much more condensed uh, you know offering in terms of uh, buildings in in the area, um, and I think from a an attraction standpoint, uh, the private sector uh, would look to the city of Hamilton to be able to um, augment the offering that's here today and perhaps add um, a new hotel, uh, perhaps uh, entertainment facilities, uh, restaurants to, to work with the, uh, the business community. Um, I think the, some of the disadvantages that, that we may or may not uh, learn is um, uh, we understand and, and know that uh, the current facility is a, is a viable facility. 
um, in, in, in the Flamborough location. Um, operators or potential operators, service providers, uh, when they do the, the business, case, uh, business cases, um, it may not make um, economical sense to move that location uh, to to uh, downtown Hamilton. So uh, that's yet to be determined. Uh, again, through the process, the private sector will will build the proposals. We'll have to review and, and evaluate those proposals, um, and that'll all be done based on um, the uh, you know the, the basically the uh, the zoning um, amendments that uh, that each of the municipalities have made. Or, Thank you, Rick, for that answer. So uh, we're going to, we have about 10 minutes before 9 o'clock, so we'll try and get as many of the questions here that uh, the individuals that are lined up. So, sir, your name and uh, where are you from? My name's Rob Moscardini, born and raised resident of Hamilton, and I'm amazed that the Americans accuse us of being a passive people after seeing this. <laughs> I have over 18 years experience in restaurants, hotels and catering in and around Hamilton. In fact, my last Hamilton project was changing the Holiday Inn on King Street to Ramada. At that time I sat on the Convention and Tourism Committee, combined with other hoteliers that I competed with, Convention and Tourism employees, Economic Development employees. We went outside of our community as a team to pitch our city. We knew there was only one way to pitch our city, and that was as a hub. We were not a destination. Never have been. We brought people in and told them that in 45 minutes to an hour, we could take them to St. Jacobs, Toronto, Niagara Falls. Today, I work for a Mercedes-Benz dealership down the road. I'm the van specialist. On a regular basis, I get tour operators coming in to look at our passenger vans and minibuses to take people out of our community. Nothing has changed in 20 years. Okay. We have also sold many Mercedes-Benz to casino employees. Obviously, they are making better than the minimum wage that a lot of our people are making at Tim Hortons and McDonald's these days. I listen to, pardon, no insult intended, fear-mongering. If I apply some of the things I heard tonight to the LCBO, to an increase in population, I should be asking council, do not increase population, we will have more crime because more people. We should close every LCBO because we are creating alcoholics. I believe in freedom of choice and to deal strictly on the minority and prohibit me from my freedom of choice, I don't agree with. I am a non-gambler, I've never been in a casino, have no intention of going to one. Okay. Let's face it, we'll never get an NHL team. We have recently reduced our debt load by putting major facilities into private sector hands. Let's give them something to work with. We couldn't do it as a community on city money and make it work. Give the private sector a chance. Give them something downtown, such as the Carmen's facility is suggesting, to make us a destination. Please don't make this another prohibition. It did not work. Thank you. And in line, your name, sir. And uh, we're going to just keep going through this line that's here. Yes, sir. My name is Andrew Altilli. I'm a Hamilton resident from East Hamilton. And uh, I've been quite impressed, and I think a lot of Hamiltonians are, with the mission statement that has been uh, established and very much taken up by most Hamiltonians. Uh, and so I would expect and ask that we make a decision on this based on that mission statement to be the best place in Canada to raise a child, to foster innovation, to engage citizen involvement. And please help me with the last one, because I forgot. Um, just from that basis, uh, I'm detecting that the large push for this is coming from the OLG. We're not certain as a city exactly where we stand with it, but I'd like to hear, I've heard some evidence on the economics, but I'm wondering if the council, or better, the economic development department, has decided if this is congruent with our overall economic plan as a long-term component. Is it going to foster innovation, for example? 
And does it fit in with the actions that we've already taken to develop art, uh, art as a destination uh, or as a draw? And uh, is there some evidence to back up that position one way or the other? I don't know the answer, but I'm hoping that the decision can be formulated in part on those terms. So that's my that's my question, but if someone can answer that. Sure, I mean, thank you very much. I, I can say that next month, in fact, Council has directed staff to go and undertake a, uh, an economic impact study, uh, and that uh, that is being uh, developed uh, and will be presented in February prior to any decision being made. So I think it's great that you referenced the vision uh, of the city, and uh, but the, your, your question specific is that that work is being undertaken by our folks in planning economic development. So if I can to you, sir, sir, your name and where you're from and your question or comment. We've got a few more people behind you. We're going to try and get done at 9 o'clock. Yes, I know that. Uh, Thank you. I, and my name is Stuart Jackson. Some of you know me on my show, Peacemaker Journey McMaster Radio. But anyways, my answer put the casino down had no to that because, one, I've been to London. I saw a result have a casino London led to a lot of vacant stores and stuff like that. So, great. No, but I say keep a Flamborough and double the size of the casino, doubling amount and having a full hotel facility at Flamborough would be far better than having in downtown Hampton. And this way, if people come to stay hotel, they're going to go have, have some fun and then, you know, enjoy, enjoy it. Like, I gone there myself at Flamborough, but I don't go get addicted to it, go to fun, but I don't get to it, but that's what I look at. So, my answer is no, not best, you know, downtown Hamilton. Flambo down, yes. Much, sir. And the next gentleman behind you, if you could, your name, sir, and where you're from. Uh, and my uh, name is Stuart Jackson. I'm a North Bend of Hamilton. I, we now know who you are, sir. I'm, I'm asking the next gentleman behind you. Thank you very oh, much I, for your comments, okay, sir. Yeah. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Brent McCayman and I am a, I'm actually from Windsor. I've lived there 17 years of my life and I've lived in Hamilton for the past two. I'm a student at Redeemer University College and woo, yeah, represent. And uh, so I think that the question that I would like to ask is to everybody who's present tonight. It's not necessarily for the councillors. Um, it's not necessarily for the OLG, but it's to everybody here. And it's a question of, fund of fundamental value. And that is, what's worth more? Human life or profit? And when I say that, I mean, is it, is it really worth the implementation of a casino that can put vulnerable people groups at risk? Like, do we, do we really believe that that's, that's a viable alter Like, there exists many viable alternatives to this casino. And that... Um, it, it's ultimately, do, do we really want to subject people to exploitation? Like, do we want, really want to create those possibilities? Because that possibility does exist. That if this casino is put in the downtown, that these people are going to be exploited. That there are going to be mental health concerns. No one is saying that that's, like, that, everyone is admitting that that is a problem that can occur. That is a problem. So, so do we really want to open the door to that? No. No. Is, is profit more valuable than people? Okay. That's, I think, I thank you very much for that question. I think you have your answer. So. Minutes here, so if we can, I'm just going to, Paul, I don't know how many more we're going to take in terms of the line. I don't know where the line ends, but... Uh, uh, but sir, your name? Five in total, Chris. Five in total, in total. and then we're going to get a sign off from the radio. But before we do that, so five more after you, sir, and then um, we'll go from there. Hi there, uh, my name is Andrew. I'm uh, from uh, Hamilton here. And I think my biggest concern is that uh, this decision will be made by March 1st by adding up all the pluses and minuses. You have more pluses at the end of the day, you'll go for this, and, uh, and if you have more minuses, you won't. And I think my problem with that, including the study that you're doing, and all the other ones, moral and uh, uh, economical and so on, is that the results are so polarized depending on who the expert is that you're talking to, that in my opinion, that quality in and of itself is enough to dump this thing. Um, we, we have as close to a sure thing as you can ask for going on downtown right now. 
we have creativity. We have innovation. Uh, we have uh, companies moving in. We have people moving in. We have uh, property values going up. We have an undeniable increase in the quality of life down here. And uh, uh, to me, anything with a question mark above it should not be allowed. Um, so, you know, rather than adding up all the pluses and minuses, I think we should just look at anything that has even the slightest chance of threatening the sure thing that we have and dump it. Thank you very much. Uh, Sir, if your, na your name, please, and where you're from. Sure. I'm Reverend Ian Sloan, and I'm the minister at Centenary United Church, which is just over there at McNabb and James Street, uh, Main Street West, sorry. And uh, I'm also a member of the Social Justice and World Outreach Committee of Hamilton Presbytery of the United Church of Canada. Uh, probably that's enough for me to say. I can probably just leave. <laughs> But 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 I do but but I did feel that it, it would be helpful in this forum because in fact there are many faith traditions in this in this city and it, it would be I think incumbent on us to be thinking about what the faith traditions have to say about questions like this. So I, I can speak from my own tradition and uh, it's a fairly moderate form of Christianity. I would hazard that there are people, hazard, don't it, so I use that word, uh, people in my congregation who, uh, who would feel that responsible gambling was a, was a, possib was a possibility and something that we, 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 can, we can have in our society. But I would like us to think a little bit about some of the reasons why we wouldn't want gambling at all in, in, in our community. And let me just give this image to you from scripture, Christian scripture. I think the, 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 the most pertinent image from Christian scripture is that of people gambling for the clothing of Jesus while he's on the cross being crucified. That's the Christian understanding of what gambling does. So uh, I, I want to give that to you to, to consider because it's about the moral fiber of our communities. And uh, you, you, you can tell I could preach a sermon, <laughs> but I won't. Thank you. Thank you very much. A few more here. Yes, please. Your name? Hi. Where are you from? My name is Kim Burns. I'm originally from Flamborough. I now live in Hamilton, and I am a horse owner, a racehorse owner. As of March 31st, I have a racehorse. April the 1st, I have a dead horse. There's going to be a lot of us that are going to have horses that will have no jobs. The OLG, I know you said that it was a government decision to end the slots at racetrack, but you have a way of correcting that. You could actually help us. You are in a position to help us. Why can't you? If you can, if you have a comment for that. I mean, I, I will reiterate um, that uh, it was a, uh, in fact, a, a government uh, decision, a policy decision to um, remove the, the SARP uh, program. Um, again, we're um, in the business of providing uh, safe and highly uh, regulated uh, entertainment for the millions of people that enjoy it across Ontario. Uh, we're trying to make sure that we're doing our job on behalf of the government and lining up uh, our products where the, where the people are. Um, so with that, I mean, we've heard uh, a number of, of uh, positions and, and uh, certainly input uh, this evening, uh, which I think we all need to, uh, to take back and, and, uh, and consider. Would you consider that? I'm not in a position tonight to, uh, you know, to commit one one way or the other on on that specific question. Um, you know, we've certainly heard the positions tonight, and all I can can uh, commit is is to take back the uh, what we've heard tonight. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we have two more questions, and then we're going to go over to uh, to Eric, and uh, before we sign off, so if you wouldn't mind stating your name and uh, where you're from. 
Sure, I'm Kate Beckett. I was born and raised here. I moved away for nine years and I moved back because I heard that Hamilton was a great place to live. It is different than when I lived here before. And my question is, um, to the rep from the OLG, um, it seems that most people are here who are in favor of the casino are in favor of it because they want the tourism dollars that are going to come from people coming into Hamilton to gamble at the casino. My question is, with the increase of casinos across Ontario, why do we think that people are going to come to Hamilton to gamble? That, that's a real question. It's not a rhetorical question. Why do we think that the Hamilton Casino will draw tourism dollars? I think Rick, Rick understands that. Could you answer yep. that question, please? Yes, certainly. Um, and whether a, a destination facility, if a destination facility is built, um, you know, with other uh, offerings, offerings within Hamilton, uh, I got to believe that 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 can attract um, a tourism. Is it going to attract all the tourism? Uh, no, because there's other communities uh, in in the province that are going to be uh, doing the same thing. But it's going to come down to again what the what type of plan the private sector puts together, what t what types of offerings that they have, um, what they they've got a uh, a great way of of partnering with with other uh, other businesses that are out there in the community and uh, we think that they're going to have a, a, a variety uh, and be very very creative with, as to what they come up with so um, thank you Rick, for that, that. We, we have one more question here and then uh, we're going to sign off uh, before we do that we'll go to Eric but if you just state your name and where you're from please my name is Christina um, I spent 25 years trying to get out of Hamilton I didn't like the city and then I went on an art crawl about three and a half years ago and made the choice six months later to move to James Street North I want to thank the I want to thank you guys up there for trying to provide us with a wonderful form of entertainment in the name of progress and in the name of profit. You guys have a hard job, I get it, you've got to make your numbers. My question, my comment and then question for City Hall is with the increased, and you guys will analyze, I trust the numbers, but with the 10% proposed increase in profits that you guys will potentially receive from putting the casino downtown as compared to Flamborough, what are the offset costs for the increased demand on the social services that we will undoubtedly end up having. My question for City Council is what commitment do we have that you guys will foot that bill and what com what commitment do we have that my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren won't have to stand here and fight for those services to be provided for in the future? It's a specific question to Hamilton, I understand what you're saying. So, I mean, Elizabeth, uh, I know in terms of the programs that you have, uh, some of those programs would address uh, an aspect of this, but I think the question goes beyond what you're able to answer. It would, it would probably delve into the work that our, our uh, general manager of community services will be doing. Um, and this is, uh, you know, I think fundamental to the, uh, the, the broad breadth of information that Council is looking for before it makes a decision. But Elizabeth, if you could just give us some of your thoughts on that question. Sure, Chris, and I'll, I'll ask Robert to weigh in a little bit as well. Um, from, the, from a health standpoint, from the problem gambling treatment standpoint, um, you know, that's just one aspect, as you said, Chris, there's many of them that relate to the, the health and social issues around this. And so if we look at problem gambling, it's important to understand that only about 1% to 2% of people who are problem gamblers come forward for treatment. So if you look at a 1% to 3.4% rate of problem gambling in, in Hamilton, that's about five to 17,000 people, and only about 1% of those come forward for treatment so and it's a very specific group that do so when we look at, at the increased numbers um, you know we're going our program is 100% funded by the province and we would be you know looking at those issues and how much um, uh, expansion to that program might come along with that but I think the biggest issue is 98% wouldn't be coming forward for treatment that's why we've also been asked to look at the issue of prevention and um, what further um, expansion of prevention programs because we know when we're out there promoting the program we do get more uptake, but I'll just turn it over to Robert. Yeah, the uh, the research that I've seen suggests that each problem gambler costs about fifty six thousand dollars at a minimum to our social and health system. Treatment, lost wages, so there's a variety of different things that's factored into there. So, problem gambling, in fact, is a very expensive social and, and health issue, and. 
I don't think we really, again, we don't really factor that in to the equation in the way that it should be. And yes, we, we do have a problem with treatment uptake. We have one of the most accessible treatment systems in the world here in Ontario. And only about 1% of in, the in-need population surfaces for treatment. We have a, a, a problem here that's highly stigmatized. There's a lot of shame attached to it. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about gambling problems too. A lot of people misidentify themselves as having not a gambling problem but a financial problem or a problem with my system or whatever. So we all got to get really better educated about this and become more willing to accept problem gambling as a, an, an issue just as we do alcohol or drug addiction. Thank you very much, Robert. We're going to turn... We're going, to, we're going to turn the floor over for a minute here to Eric to sign off, and then I'll make just my concluding. And Can thing. I ask one question? No, no sir. No. One question. And it is for our mayor. What other business are you well, going to bring into much. this city that will create as many jobs as this one will? I hear you. Again. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So if we could turn to Eric, please. Eric? Thank you very much, Chris. I... Thank you, Chris. I just want to say thank you to everyone who's joined us so far in the City of Hamilton's virtual information forum. I'm happy to be involved in this historic meeting with over 24,000 people that have joined us today. We can safely say this is the largest meeting in Hamilton's history, and I want to thank everyone for their questions tonight, and thank you for everyone being so patient on the call. We just hope that you enjoyed this forum tonight. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, Eric, and everyone that participated. I want to thank our panelists. They were, I think, fantastic. They did a great job. And, uh, and heard very clearly what you have to say. And I want to thank staff, uh, uh, certainly uh, Mike Kirkopoulos, Paul Johnson, Lisa Zinkowicz, for, uh, and Norm Schlein. And good night. Drive safely. Thank you.